Just uh, members, that is us in public session. Um, so just advise members that the committee meeting will be, as usual, recorded, recorded and broadcast and online um, and advise anybody in the public gallery that they're welcome to use mobile mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted and I would just remind, remind members as well to, to make sure their phones are on mute. Uh, in the public gallery you can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi and password details are available on the gallery rules and it is not permitted uh, to take photographs or record any of the meeting. So we, as usual, have a, have a packed agenda, so we will try and get through as quick as we can. Um, so uh, any, any items of business that we can get through quickly, we will do so. Hi, Robbie. Um, in terms of apologies, we have two this week. So we have apologies from David Brooks and from Cathy Mason. Uh, and I think apart from that, everybody else is here, so no other apologies. Moving quickly on to item two on the agenda, chairperson's business. Um, so just a, a couple of things to draw out very quickly. Um, so I was able to attend the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee visit to Hazelwood Integrated College uh, at the beginning of the week. Um, the clerk has provided a briefing note of that meeting. Um, really, really interesting. The school employs their own social worker, employs their own mental health nurse, uh, and really, really impactful and effective uh, engagement with the students. So it was really, it was really impressive to actually hear about the work that, that Hazelwood are doing in that space. So I think it was, it was, it was a, it was a, a, a very timely visit. Uh, who pays for the? So that, oh, just in the work that was the interesting bit. So they had had in the past bits of sort of, uh, I think, philanthropic philanthropic funding that had enabled them to, 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 to establish the rule, but they saw so much value in it, they, they find it in their budget now. Yeah. So uh, the, there's... Uh, I, I was down in Lockshore the other day, mm -hmm. the principal down there. Yeah. And it's actually a very small number of people in that. Uh, it's a very low ratio between teacher and pupil, you yeah. know. But the, the principal says that, you know, a couple of things would, that would really help in that school mm -hmm. is uh, a social worker and a psychologist and yeah. maybe one day a week. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of kids who go to CAMS and things like that often don't travel or can't travel, can't get there. Whereas if they were, if they were doing a mental health worker in the school at the time. It would be very, very useful, you know. I think it's a Excuse message me, that we're having yeah. a broadcast problem. Ah, right, okay. Technical problem. Yeah. They've asked us to take a quick uh, suspension, no but problem. I don't want to okay. interrupt the. Okay. Beg yeah. your pardon. Public. So that's us back in, in public session. And for anybody who was following the, the, the live stream, apologies. There was a bit of a, a technical glitch there that, that we dropped out for a few minutes. Um, so we were just at item two, which is chairperson's business. And, and we've had a, a bit of a discussion uh, around the visit to Hazelwood Integrated College. Um, and I think one of the, the main things coming out was that multidisciplinary approach that, that they are really exemplifying. And that's something I think the committee's already expressed an interest in pursuing and on a cross-cutting basis with health as well. So. Um, um, there was also uh, the event earlier in the week uh, that both myself and the deputy chair attended um, as co-sponsors at the, of the Unison campaign in relation to uh, universal free school meal provision. Um, that was a really, really interesting event and definitely there is a sense that they, they are very keen to pick up the momentum with that campaign again uh, and it was discussed that there would be considerable interest in them presenting to committee on that so I think that should be factored in uh, to, to forward work planning uh, as well. Um, and I think there was there was obviously a strong desire at that at that event to see us move into a universal provision here. There was also a degree of pragmatism around you know how that can be phased and around you know how you can tar best target the approach. So I thought it was a very helpful uh, event. I don't know, yeah, Deputy no, Chair, if you anything to agree with that, yeah. Okay, that's grand. Sure, just on that, I, mm -hmm. mean, if I, if I just discuss something across. With Pat, Pat, you have a motion next week on re in regards. Is it next week or the week after in regards to this, uh, free school meals? Isn't that right? Or sorry, holiday, holiday hunger, hunger, holiday, holiday hunger. hunger. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We could possibly not in the amendment that one, but develop the discussion in that because I think it's a, it has serious yeah. legs and serious benefits yeah. to maybe develop. Well, we had we had actually intended to bring it in the last mandate, okay. but then the minister decided that she would fund it. The difficulty was because it wasn't on a statutory basis when the cuts came that that was just. Yep. thrown out completely you know I think there's other ways to do there's a, probably more creative ways as a place that we could probably look into the wider the universal um, application of it because 
I don't know how you do it, like, but rather than just coming out of that that that, that top line figure, um, yeah. is potential maybe some sort of committee motion, perhaps, is okay. something we could look at down the line on that if anyone was interested. Sure. But I mean, getting Unison in would be a good first step, I think, <coughs> to yeah. hear from them. So, <coughs> they're in the work in. plan for yeah. the informal meeting and um, first day back after recess. Yes, I think probably more on industrial relations at that stage, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's fine. But look, I, I don't I don't want to labour the point too much, but I certainly I think that is an issue that the committee will want will want to pick up. Um, so unless there's any anything arising from that, uh, I'm happy to move on to item three, which is matters arising, of which I have none, unless anyone has anything to add. Nope. Um, so that takes us to item four, which is the draft minutes. Um, so the minutes uh, of the committee meeting of the 6th of March are at page six of members' packs. Um, can I uh, propose that those are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Is that agreed? Good. Agreed. agreed. Thank you. I'll just get those signed. Okay, so that moves us on to item five uh, on the agenda um, and members will have received a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 18 um, and that is in relation to uh, the SL1 period products, Department of Education specified public service bodies regulations NI 2024 um, and that can be found, uh, the, the, the SL1 itself can be found at page 20. Um, there is also a second report uh, of, of the examiner of statutory rules at page 10 of your table papers and I would just note that the examiner has not raised any concerns regarding the statutory rule in her report. Uh, so I would like to welcome to committee, uh, we have uh, two officials from the department who have kindly come back uh, today after uh, we, we didn't get to, to, to go ahead with their briefing last week. So we have Dale Heaney, Head of Tackling Educational Advantage uh, team uh, in the department uh, and uh, Ashley Mitford from the same team. So. We would suggest um, that maybe a, a short five-minute presentation, up to five minutes, just on the on the proposed statutory rule, with some time uh, for questions from members uh, following that. So happy to, to hand over to you at this stage. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Committee members. Um, thank you for inviting us to present the SL1 um, on the period products, Department of Education, specified public service bodies, regulations, North Ireland 2024. Uh, we're aware that the committee would also like to discuss the educational support that could potentially support the rollout of the Peer Products uh, Free Provisions Act. We're happy to touch on that if, if there's time. Uh, in terms of the regulations themselves, uh, the powers are provided under the Act for DE are, are very specific, so I'll touch on those in turn if that's okay. Under the Act, uh, departments must specify which of their bodies will be legally required to make sure free period products are available for use on their premises. As well as specifying public service bodies, the regulations may provide for descriptions of premises, people, and when premises are be treated as in use. So the regulation making powers under the Act go no further than that, uh, Chairman and Committee members. Given the policy intention of the Act to make products widely available, DE aims to minimise any limitation of this provision in making the regulations. Uh, turning first to the bodies that we're proposing to specify in the regulations and starting with scope provision, DE is required to specify bodies with functions that would enable them to discharge their duties in relation to persons in school premises. So in relation to schools, DE is proposing to specify the Education Authority as manager of controlled schools, boards of governors of all voluntary schools and grant maintained integrated schools, and any proprietors of independent schools. DE may also specify public service bodies other than schools, provided that the specified bodies are statutory, uh, serving the public uh, or the public interest. So DE is proposing to specify the Education Authority in relation to statutory youth settings, the Education Authority um, education other than at school settings, and in relation to administrative accommodation. So other arms and bodies that meet the definition of a public service body under the Act, specifically the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools, the Northern Ireland Council uh, for Curriculum Examinations and Assessment, and the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland are also included in the proposed list of specified public service bodies in relation to their administrative accommodation. So the SL1 provides details of a small number of public service bodies which could be specified in the regulations, but DE is not proposing to do so for practical reasons, as well as a number of <coughs> arms length bodies that cannot be specified because they are not statutory. Given time constraints today, I don't propose to speak to those, uh, but now but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I said earlier that the Act allows DE to provide descriptions of persons and premises in order to ensure that the Act can be made workable in the education sector, and the proposed regulations do contain such descriptions. 
So firstly, descriptions of premises. I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, in the chair, in the case of, of schools, uh, regulations will include all buildings comprising school premises. This means all buildings used for non-educational purposes, for example, eating, leisure or sport, as well as those using for, used for learning will, will be captured, so long as they form part of the premises of the school. This will be important in ensuring reasonable access of free products, which is required under the Act. Eutus and statutory youth settings are captured where those settings are on EA premises, so whether leased or owned. And finally, regulations will include administrative accommodation leased or owned by a specified public service body for the purposes of affecting its statutory functions. Uh, so that's EA, C C CCMS and GTCNI are included in the proposed list of public service bodies in relation to their administrative accommodation. So secondly, uh, descriptions of people. DE is proposing to limit provision in all settings to pupils, staff and visitors to school premises or in, in EA EOTA settings, young people, staff and visitors in statutory youth settings and staff and visitors in the administrative accommodation of specified public service bodies. In all cases, visitor is defined as a person with legitimate reason to be on the premises. So the general public are not entitled uh, to go into these settings to obtain free period products. Uh, this is particularly important for the safeguarding of children and young people. Uh, so, Chair and, and Committee members, an eight-week public consul consultation was undertaken by DE, including the Department of Education's arms length bodies, schools and the DE wider stakeholder base. We received 47 responses, which provided useful clarification on points of detail, but did not necessitate a significant change to the policy proposals. And DE's response to this consultation is published on its website. We anticipate that the cost of provision for pre-period -per -per products to be in the region of 0.8 million per annum. This will be subject to approval of a business case and DE will need to bid for the funding. The committee will be aware that the rule is subject to such approval under a draft affirmative procedure. It is proposed that will come into operation on the day after it is approved by the Assembly and the rule together with the expanded memorandum has been laid and I understand the business office has provided copies to the committee. So uh, other than that, uh, Chair and committee members, um, uh, DE is required to review the regulations at, at least every three years and nothing further to say on the proposed regulations. Uh, I, I can pause there uh, and perhaps talk on, touch on the education support uh, through questions. Okay. Uh, th thanks very much for the uh, for the for the, the presentation on that. Um, I, I would have a couple of quick questions and then just over to to other members who may uh, wish to ask. The first was just in relation to the provision that it's noted is not um, going to be made or cannot be made. I think it's stated for NICE, Cena Jean, or the Middletown Centre for Autism. Can you just provide a bit of clarity as to why? those particular bodies can't be specified? So um, the ones that um, are excluded because they're not statutory are, yes, Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education, uh, CNAG and Middletown Centre for Autism. The, the Act requires um, that a body is statutory, so if it's not formed under uh, statute, <coughs> can't be specified because of the way the, the act, act is drafted. Um, so any provision in those bodies would have to be, could be um, explored on a non-statutory basis. But we can't put them in there, we can't specify them in the regulations because of how the Act is drafted. Simply that. Are there plans in place to, to explore that non-statutory provision? Is that something that's actively being, being looked at? That's something we, we could explore with those bodies. Um, obviously it would be on, on a voluntary basis. Um, and they, we've, we've done exploratory discussions with the department, for example, who again, um, because it wasn't specified within the Act originally, uh, departments um, providing these products to their staff, for example, would do so on a, on a voluntary basis, and that, that is happening in practice. So there's nothing to stop from those, those discussions from taking place. So I suppose through the consultation that um, the various bodies will <coughs> with themselves, we can uh, ensure that that's highlighted to those bodies to make sure that uh, they consider what's required. And I just have one other question. I know other members are maybe looking to come in. Um, it, it's in relation to the reference to the fact that the funding will need to be bid for and that it's, there's going to need to be a business uh, case established for this. Can, can you assure the committee that this that these regulations will actually result in this provision being provided? Because I think that would be the concern if we you know we, we, we consent to these uh, regulations and then the, the, you know a business case falls. So is there any sense around the likely funding that's going to be made available? Uh, but just really any assurances that you can give committee in that regard? Of course. Um, well, the good news is that there's already uh, four hundred thousand pounds in the, in the baseline um, for twenty three twenty four, and we're hoping that, that will continue into twenty four twenty five. Um, so that allows for the provision to pupils, which has been the case for the last three years now. Um, uh, 
but obviously the, the Act and, and these regulations require additional provision to staff, education professionals, visitors, etc. And we estimate that to be roughly the same uh, element of cost, so an, an additional 0.4 uh, million. Um, so with the legislation driving forward that, that requirement, um, you know, we anticipate um, it being um, uh, optimistic in terms of our uh, likelihood of getting that, but obviously we can't say for, for certain given the other financial pressures. And obviously other departments are in a very similar position. I suppose we're in the advantage of having had a three-year pilot with pupils that we can say, at least assuredly, that th that provision can continue. And to that, and to that four hundred thousand, that would that cover youth provision as well? But that, at the moment, the the provision um, is, is primarily for schools. Uh, but we know that the the education sector, sorry, the, the uh, youth sector within the education authority has made provision um, for young people in those settings, and that's helping us uh, finalise the the the, the, f the the final cost that we'll, that we'll provide provided by the regulations. Thank you. Um, Deputy Chair, are you looking to come? Yeah, just, just, just a quick one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. I understand why, you know, the, the some places are being excluded because they're, they're uh, because the legislation excluded them. But I, I would like to think that the department would work closely with, with whatever organisations are excluded so that uh, there can be some arrangement on a voluntary basis. I mean, I was in one of the AOTIS settings last week there, uh, Lockshore Resource Centre, you know, which is probably disproportionately disadvantaged uh, uh, and, and high levels of need within that particular setting. Uh, and, you know, they're the type of young people who would benefit by this particular scheme. So, uh, I mean, there's no real question there except to say that, you know, the department should be working with these and these other organisations and particularly with the OTIS settings because that's where there is, uh, there are high levels of disadvantage. Thanks. And, and the good news, of course, is that the OTIS settings are covered. So. Um, are covered. They, they will be covered. They will be. Um, right. if they're, yeah, uh, they will be in the regulations if they're on EA premises. Um, there are some community-based EOTA settings which would fall out of the regulations, but they're part of the current pilot scheme in any case, so uh, that provision could carry on um, and, you know, as we transition from the pilot scheme to, to permanent provision. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, Robbie, you were looking to come in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so two, um, one, the second part will be maybe if you, rather than me ask questions about the additional benefits and what was learnt through the pilot in terms of the um, information, the, the, the stigma busting and, and all of the, the, the good stuff that happened in and around the educational piece, but on the, the availability of the product, this is obviously a piece of legislation that just doesn't, it, it applies in a wider sense. Uh, with the TEO or the, the sponsor body um, and therefore applies probably to other departments. Um, in the youth sector provision then is there any way that any of the other departments are picking any of the weight up in regard to that? So for instance the Department of Communities if in terms of their funding streams so and then is there a top level analysis to ensure that there aren't we minimise the gaps and holes where and picking up in Pat's point there are places where which will be um, there'd be more kids from a, a socially disadvantaged background, for instance, and we know that those young people present, m not exclusively, but more likely to present in areas which are maybe not statutory um, owned, statutory owned premises. So in terms of that wider analysis across the departments, is there a, is there some, is there a, a scheme going on that, that captures the try and make sure that the, it minimises the gaps that are appearing for each of the departments, yeah. Yeah, maybe if I touch on the, the second point, actually, uh, refresh, um, uh, uh, cover the, the the points regarding feedback from schools, because uh, that has been very positive. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of cross-departmental working over the last year or more, um, so that's been um, really led by the executive office with um, you know, significant input from ourselves and the Department for Communities. Uh, and so part one of the Act 
uh, requires that general duty to provide period products. And my understanding is that TEO has been working with Northern Ireland Libraries to ensure that that cover uh, will be taken forward through that provision. So that will cover a lot of uh, ground in, in terms of public availability. Um, but equally, um, we find through discussions with the FE, for example, that some of the higher education settings, uh, like Stramillas, for example, also house uh, the control of secular schools council, for example, and um, so provision you know in buildings where there are co-located uh, other organisations are all very <coughs> and uh, uh, and deliverable. So uh, I think where we're possible, a lot of the collaboration that's going on has involved departments talking to one another to see where can we ensure that the there are no gaps um, as far as that is possible uh, and as far as the budget will will, will, will uh, stretch. Um, so that's been very positive. Um, and so so far, you know, all of the officials have been very supportive of, of the um, intent behind the act uh, to make sure that no matter which building you're in, um, these, these products could be made available. Obviously, there are limitations in terms of what the legislation requires, um, but certainly our experience in, in school settings has been very positive. Yeah. Um, since, since the pilot scheme launched in September 2021, um, we've had really good engagement by schools. Uh, 82 to 100 percent of schools have ordered under the scheme, which is really high in a short period. Um, and while there's a we're completing a post-project evaluation, even though the pilot scheme isn't due to finish in due to, until June, we're doing the evaluation now so we can inform the way forward with the uh, legislation rollout. But um, there's some really good um, published results from the SIA surveys. Um, you'll recall SIA provided the support on the educational side of the pilot scheme and the EA delivered the uh, period free period product side of it. So just some highlights um, from the SIA reports. Um, so the scheme in the initial uh, survey that SIA um, undertook, we had 1,681 pupils and 761 teachers responding to that and over 98%. Uh, so an overwhelming welcome of the scheme and uh, a real need for it, um, which was very encouraging. Um, and in the most recent survey by SIA, 82% of pupils who have used the scheme reported that they increased their confidence in managing their periods in school. 78% of pupils found free period products to be helpful in attending school and carrying out their normal activities. And this one's interesting, 39% think that the period dignity scheme has reduced stigma. Um, associated with periods in their school, 59% of teachers, so there's a bit of a difference there, think it's helped to reduce stigma. Um, and 88.3% of pupils confirmed in the survey that free period products are available in their schools. So it's, there's some real success stories there in terms of those numbers. Um, and let's see, yes, and 81% of teachers agreed that the products are more success, uh, accessible. The stigma figure, that's really good progress in a short period, but stigma is obviously slow to break down, and there's um, clearly more work to do there. Um, and that's, we'll, we'll be working with we'll seeing what that looks like going forward. But um, we've produced some really um, excellent resources and delivered uh, teacher professional learning. Um, and communications activity, so I think that's that part of the scheme has worked very well and essential. Just to make one point, point and finally, it's just I think, think in terms of the yeah. debates previously in the chamber, one of the things that came out most when we spoke to young people was the barrier to participation, inclusion, and attendance at times, and that this would be one of the unintended benefits, if you like. So it's really important that the voice of the young people is picked up often and reviewed to ensure that you know that, that that those are the other tangible benefits which will be transformational for the lives of young young girls in particular thank you thank you chair. thank you robert uh danny well, thank you chair and you'll be glad to know my my question was was asked but i'll, I'll make the main point as well around our young people went through the community and voluntary sector they are <coughs> majority of young people at the youth club is actually community and voluntary so they can't avail of this because it's not a statutory setting um but what you touched on the stigma we have in, in the youth club that I volunteer in, we have a young women's group and, and they actually lead the way in other youth clubs around our area and they, they make sure there's products going there. But again, that's our young people taking the lead and the community voluntary sector again doing that when their resources are already thin because through the cost of living crisis, they don't get an uplift on electricity, on heating or anything like that there. So it's just about that, that, that it there that when you said stigma, that's the one thing they were saying it was reducing as well. So it's great, but it's also unfair that, that, that they're left to do it as well when the when the strategy youth clubs get it. So just to make that point.
you done it? Got an indication from Kate. I don't think any other members. Cheryl as well. No. So Kate and then Cheryl. Uh, thank you um, very much uh, for your time and presentation. I'm really heartening to hear, um, especially around stigma, I think. Um, can you provide an update on the policy creation around take-home products um, for pupils? Um, and also, will the regulations ensure that the products are readily available as opposed to having to be requested? I can, I can touch that, I'm sure Ashley can, can add to it. Um, certainly our experience and feedback from schools so far has been has been very positive in terms of the level of budget that's been provided. So there hasn't been any um, negative feedback in terms of not having sufficient products to provide for uh, girls' needs in, in school. Um, so there, there's been no limitations placed, for example, on, on the current provision, and you know, we don't propose doing so going forward. And we want to talk in more detail uh, across the departments to see uh, what the uh, advice might be in terms of take-home provision, whether we need to encourage um, children, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, to think about that uh, and to not be criticised, for example, if, if, if they're seen um, to be taking more than perhaps seems appropriate. But So, um, again, that's probably down, down to breaking down barriers and stigma around if you need the, the products, then by all means use them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I certainly feel that the, the budget estimates so far um, have been broadly right and the feedback both from primary sector schools and post-primary school sector schools has been very positive in terms of the level of funding they've been pro provided with. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're we're on the right lines in terms of providing uh, as much, if not perhaps slightly more than is needed at times. Mm -hmm. um, but that can be hard to judge because there are so many settings that, that we're obviously dealing with across the, the full academic year. I don't know, I if you want to add to that. Uh, yeah, just to say, um, under the Act, the Executive Office have a responsibility for a universal scheme, which um, is for to meet people's needs wherever they are, even uh, you know, even to take on holiday, for example. So it is the take-home provision part of the Period Products Act. Um, but as Dale said, you know, there, there may still be the opportunity for um, girls to take products home from school, but they will have access to that universal scheme as well that the Executive Office are responsible for putting in place. Um, for May this year um, and actually from the most recent CIA survey um, we asked do you feel comfortable going somewhere else to get the products and actually it was quite a positive I'm sorry I don't have the figure off the top of my head but it was quite a positive response that yes I'd be content to go and, and get products elsewhere so um, you know clearly pupils would be willing whatever that scheme looks like to, to actually get products from outside school as well mm. So yeah, very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, that's great. And I welcome it. I think it's fantastic. Just kind of off the back of Kate's point, um, in terms of provision then, is that monitored in any sense? Uh, uh, what I mean is I've been in an organisation previously where they... I could describe as like a mammoth order um, of products for very few women. It's just wondering how that can provision, if it's maybe not being used in one setting, can that be shared? Or, or, or what way is that monitored? Three, the financial year. Um, it is something we're we're conscious of, and over the last three years, we've tried to uh, ensure that you know, we're getting the, the um, allocations broadly right. Um, we're, we're seeing roughly twenty percent uptake um, by the stage in year three, and uh, that's in keeping with what the profile of spend in England, Scotland, Wales has been. We thought we might reach thirty percent of uptake, um, um, but it's been slightly lower than that in practice. Um, but what we did this year was keep back a contingency, a contingency pot of money, um, because we were we didn't want to underspend, um, and so we contacted schools in the autumn of twenty twenty three, uh, both primary and post primary, and asked them, you know, did they think the allocations were broadly along the right levels, uh, or did they need need more did they indeed need less so the, the figures for primary were very positive uh, the vast majority felt that they were content with what they've been allocated and they're given a, a, a number of products they don't have to order so there's none of that complexity involved for post primary schools who do order based on the budget they're given um, there was a, a, a again a very positive picture in terms of what they've been allocated uh, roughly it was 30 percent had, had asked um, 30 percent of schools in post primary sector uh, said they could do with more uh, and only uh, six percent and uh, said they uh, they were happy or, or didn't know. So um, it, it is something that we're conscious of and we need to continue to, to monitor, but we think we've got that system right. Well, that sounds great. And it's good to see that people are asking for more. So obviously the uptake is, is getting there as well. So no, thank you very much.
Yeah, is that okay? Uh, thank you both uh, very much for being here today and uh, I really welcome some of the feedback there that you've included uh, in survey outcomes, uh, especially around tackling stigma. Um, I note, of course, the reason for this bill was to tackle those barriers to participation um, and it's been touched on previously there just around the issue of school attendance and um, female sport. I'm wondering, is, has there been any uh, data recorded or monitored around um, uptake of females doing sport and school attendance? attendance gone up? Is that something you're looking at or something maybe you're considering looking at as well? Uh, it's something that um, we're very interested in trying to, to get a, a greater handle on. Uh, I think that the issue with school attendance at the moment is that it's being impacted by so many different factors. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to see um, what is a relatively small project and, and its, it, its impact. Uh, so we're able to draw on the, the qualitative information we get back from schools, which, as I say, is, is largely very positive, and through the CA surveys, which are conducted independently. Again, that would seem to reaffirm um, the, the, the messages behind the, the, the investment today. It has been very positive and welcomed by pupils as well as teachers. In terms of sport uptake, again, lots of challenges about getting girls to do sport, particularly as they go into post-primary. Uh, and so there, there's a number of issues uh, to, to be uh, teased out, I suppose, in terms of whether or not this particular project had, a, had an impact, a positive impact. Um, Again, we're limited in terms of how many surveys we can ask because there's so many different subject mm -hmm. subject we could co potentially cover and <coughs> conscious of um, the return rates that we might get. But that's certainly something that we can keep in mind and, and we hope to continue to work with SIA, who have been very good at engaging, as you see from the numbers that Ashley quoted, uh, getting in the region of almost 2,000 pupils to respond is, is really positive. So that could be something we could expand to include those sorts of questions. You know. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. You will have no no other indications. So uh, th thank you, thank the officials um, for for the presentation and for answering the questions. Um, so the, the 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 only real sort of action arising from that is uh, for me to ask the committee if it's content that the Department of Education proceeds with the period products Department of Education specified public service bodies regulations NI twenty twenty four. Is this agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. While the officials leave, we'll be moving into private session now. So if we can move into private session and then we'll, we'll have our uh, next item, which is item six, the public finance scrutiny workshop. In uh, public session, if you want to bring uh, the witnesses through, that would be great. So that is us moving on to item seven uh, on the agenda. So I would refer members to the briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 29 and written submissions at pages 20 to 54 of the table papers. Um, so just while we get everybody through, um, we are delighted uh, to welcome uh, Kolya Nigel Skolyokta today, along with representatives from Queen's University. Um, I'll let everybody get settled before we start. Well, these chairs don't work on carpet. <laughs> you have to take the with arms in these and then you stand up your fingers when you slid in. Oh, oh, oh. So That's why the arms were taken off. It's it's an honour, my Dave. Through good afternoon. But you can all introduce yourselves in a wee bit more detail when we get started. So, uh, presenting today, um, we have Maria Thomason, um, CEO uh, from CNG, uh, Orna Nagari, Senior Education Officer from CNG, Ashling O'Boyle, uh, Director from the Centre for Language Education at QUB, uh, Dr. Mel Engman from the Centre for Language Education QUB, and Dr. Yakid Ortega from the Centre for Language Education at QUB. So, I hope I've got all. All the pronunciations correct there for everybody uh, and you are really very welcome today um, so we're going to have the opportunity today which is great for the committee to have its first chance to use the simultaneous uh, translation um, service so my understanding is that for the presentation from CNG we'll be using that and then for QUB and the Q&A we will be um, conducting that in English is that correct or um, 
If the questions come in Irish, we're happy yes. to take them in Irish, and if they come in English, we'll respond. Okay, in English. so we so so we have the options to do that. So that's great. We've maximum flexibility here, today, which, is, which is great, and it, it, we're we're delighted as a committee to have the opportunity to use to use that facility today. So uh, presentation, and um, we would say I know there's quite a number of you here today, um, but we want to make sure we have good time for for questions. So we, we would be suggesting up to ten minutes uh, for the presentation. I know that could be tight for time, but uh, we're we're already running over substantially. <laughs> And I, I know you have a lot, a lot you'll want to cover. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, move straight into presentation. Um, and I think I've just advised members they'll need to turn the volume up on their headsets because they're all down, uh, down, down at zero at the moment. Good afternoon. I have just realised that I have the English version in front of me, so I will try to do a site translation of it. I'm not sure how that happened, but I hope we, our translators will be uh, uh, happy to uh, work along. Uh, my name is Maria Thomason and I am Chief Executive of, of Corleone de Gielsko Leacte and I am joined by Ora Negari, Senior Education Officer with Corleone, Dr. Ashley O'Boyle, Dr. Mel Engman and Dr. Ye Yasid Ortega from the Centre for L Languages Education Research at Queen's University. I thank you for this opportunity to discuss Irish medium education and the work of Corleone. Uh, I would also like to thank in the first place the interpreters of the uh, assembly as it is truly a pleasure to be able to present to you today in Irish. I would like to take this opportunity in the first instance to recognise and commend the students in the sector and to thank the practitioners for the commitment and dedication they show to you students and parents uh, every day. The Irish medium education sector has existed for more than 50 years. In 1971, Agile School was established on Shaw's Road in Belfast with nine pupils. And in 2024, approximately 7,500 pupils attend 44 nursery schools, 35 primary schools and five post-primary schools. It is a great source of pride that Irish medium education is available in all sectors. According to research carried out internationally by experts and scientists, there are many benefits associated with immersion education, including social, cognitive and communication benefits. Uh, pardon me. Immersion education is a form of bilingual education the immersion education pedagogy is used in Irish medium schools where all subjects are taught through the medium of Irish. So I want to be clear that Irish is used in our schools as a vehicle or a vector through which uh, Irish medium pupils ex access the Northern Ireland curriculum. In 2000, the uh, Department of Education established Cordon de Gael Scaliacta to support them in implementing the statutory duty to encourage and facilitate Irish medium uh, education. Uh, Cordon de Gael Scaliacta's vision is to have a network of energetic, sustainable Irish medium schools from preschool to post primary available to all those who wish to attend. Uh, in which high uh, quality education is provided. As an organisation, we have a broad role to play in achieving this vision. We provide advice and guidance to the public, to DE and other educational groups, and we take every opportunity to put Irish medium education at the heart of every conversation. 
However, we are a small organisation and at present it is very, um, it is impossible for us to address all aspects of our work or to support uh, members of the public who wish to establish new Irish medium provisions. This is neither right nor correct and it certainly is not fulfilling the statutory duty. With continued growth, growth uh, come challenges. The uh, sector operates in a monolingual system that does not understand immersion education pedagogy, pedagogy and does not consider the needs of the sector. Today we face the same challenges as we as were recognised in the review of Irish medium education published by DE back in 2008. It is clear that DE needs an Irish medium policy immediately to provide uh, clear guidance and to ring fence funding to address the well documented challenges and to provide appropriate support to the sector. An Irish medium policy uh, would also ensure accountability within DE and EA, um, for example, in their dealings with the sector. Our role in Corlea is not only to highlight challenges, but also to find uh, and present solutions. We have the solutions. All that is required now is the structure, the political will and the investment to implement them. 60% of Gael Scullina are located in buildings that are temporary or that are not suitable for the school setting. Although the department has done a lot of work over the years, much remains to be done uh, to achieve equity with the English language sector. Corlean de Gilskolliacta believes that the department must urgently design and progress an accommodation improvement programme for the sector uh, to bridge this gap and provide an appropriate learning environment for all students in the sector. We have been uh, aware of the lack of support and appropriate provision for students with SEN in the Irish medium sector um, from as far back as 1999. Time and again the sector has been omitted from the plans and this is reflected in the latest approach to the SEN transformation project. This is unacceptable. We must challenge this current approach as the system is failing these children day after day. Uh, teacher supply is the biggest barrier to the development uh, of the sector today. This is now a, cr a crisis situation. Go, uh, pardon me. And the department must urgently put solutions in place to ensure that there are sufficient teachers to pr deliver the full curriculum in every Gael Scholar. Corleone Gales Gullianca produced a paper on this issue and shared it with DE in August 2023. Recommendations and solutions, some of which are cost neutral, are clearly set out in that paper. Now is the time to act on them. You have a copy of that paper in the information uh, packs. The a First Start or AFS report identified issues relating to teacher retention and a lack of opportunities for teacher professional learning in the sector. The report indicates that these difficulties could have an impact on the ongoing underachievement of children and young people in the sector. It is uh, because of specific funding that we have received through AFS that we were able to commission research uh, commission research on this matter. Uh, this research was undertaken by Ashleen and her team and I now invite them to uh, spend a few moments uh, outlining the main findings and I thank you for your indulgence. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to join in this presentation of evidence. Um, my name is Dr. Ashley McBoyle. I'm gathered here together with our team from the Centre for Educational Research at Queen's University Belfast. A little bit of background about who we are. Between us, we have a number of decades of language education research in different countries and continents around the globe, and we bring that together here um, as part of what we did in, in this report. So, just to take you through. Uh, 
some of the, the key points of, of what we did. First of all, in order to address a better understanding of the challenges faced by Irish immersion practitioners in the north of Ireland and Northern Ireland, we undertook an international systematic review of literature and that provided us with a baseline of what are the types of additional challenges that are faced by other immersion educators across the world. Uh, and so those countries include, we have a long list of countries and you can see what they are. So that's part of what we undertook a systematic uh, style literature review uh, and did that because to avoid any uh, cherry picking or avoid any bias that uh, might come along. And what we produced as a result of that was a list of competencies, a list of additional challenges faced by Irish immersion educators, and we also produced a list of potential responses to those challenges and to those additional uh, workload capacities. What we also did as part of the, the, the research was to conduct interviews with a range of stakeholders, so a range of practitioners engaged in the Irish medium uh, education sector. So those included teachers, so Irish immersion teachers, it included principals, leaders of schools. We also wanted to get teacher educators' perspectives to see what they thought about current life being an Irish medium practitioner in Northern Ireland. And we also engaged with student teachers, so the new teachers coming through and um, wanting to know what they thought about the Irish medium education sector in Northern Ireland. Um, that is the approach that we took to, in order to gather data. On the basis of that data, we then worked with uh, Irish medium practitioners and produced an eight-point action plan. Um, so based on the systematic review of international evidence, based on the multi-perspectival interviews with stakeholders and uh, then created an action plan as a result. And so that eight point action plan stands. If I have a moment, uh, I might just uh, give a little bit more detail about some of the findings from talking to the practitioners in Northern Ireland. Um, I suppose it goes, if I may, um, it was quite a surprise to us coming from international contexts about the types of burdens that we hear placed on Irish immersion educators in Northern Ireland. Uh, certainly they're they told us plenty of times about the impact of the lack of resources. So it's not just about the lack of resources, it's the impact that the lack of those resources have on teachers, have on pupils and have on the school itself. One of the other significant issues that they brought to our attention was uh, their concerns around assessment practices. Um, they were uncertain about assessment practices, uncertain about uh, uh, some of the, the, the impact that those assessment practices were having on young people in their schools. One of the other issues that were highlight, was, was highlighted from our interviews was around a, a being able to produce a language-rich environment, being able to scaffold a language rich environment for the young people who are in Irish schools. So that means having teachers who are able to use Irish language in all sorts of different ways. It means classrooms being big enough for the numbers of increasing students. It means subject specific materials. So there is a maths book in Irish, so there is a chemistry book in Irish. So those are the types of things around scaffolding a language rich environment that was uh, came across to us as very important. And finally, one of the significant areas, and I think this is crucial to explore for the future, is around the professional development of the teachers that we currently have and the leaders that are within the Irish medium education. There, we have been told a number of times within the interviews about how excellent practice exists, but we've also been told about how teachers are burnt out. Irish immersion teachers have been carrying quite a heavy load for a number of decades, and, uh, and I think that's something that comes across very clear within our research. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think there was some, an impressive sort of two, two levels of simultaneous translation going on there, Maria. So that, that was very, very impressive. Um, so, but again, great, really, really want to just add my thanks to the to the service here and then the assembly as well for providing that service for us today. We were really, really delighted. Uh, we didn't get in to be the first committee to use it, but uh, we're, we're very happy to, happy to be the, to be the second. Um, look, there's a, there's a, there's an awful lot that we could cover here, um, and I think particularly arising out of the the, the research from QUB, there really 
really is so much uh, to cover. So I, I think if there, there are probably members will have, will have uh, uh, questions covering a range of issues. I, I just wanted to deal with, with one in particular. And given that we have officials coming in shortly after this around uh, capital and infrastructure, would you be able to give us an insight into sort of where, where the gaps in terms of the, the, the provision in, in Irish medium education are currently? Um, so where, where you might see the need for capital investment, and I'm thinking particularly of actually developing new schools, and I'm thinking more particularly in terms of post-primary. The message that I hear coming through quite strongly is that a, a lot of parents, their children go through primary setting in, in Irish medium, and then when it comes to making that post-primary transition, there really is no viable local option without having to, to be asked to travel very long distances and, and the two post-primary options are not far off oversubscribed or, or, or at capacity so I just wanted to get an idea of where you would see in terms of capital development um, so that we can plan for, for, for provision where that's at. Yeah, thanks very much, Nick, for your question and it's, it's a pivotal question for the sector. I suppose our business is all about growing the sector, encouraging and facilitating the development of Irish medium education. What I would say is that from my experience, I can see that there is at some level facilitation ongoing, but I don't see an awful lot of encouragement if you take if you pick apart the statutory duty. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, our role is to ensure that Irish medium provision from early years right through to post-primary is available for all those who wish to avail of it, and that is certainly not the case. Uh, there's a very long, I suppose, explanation as to why that is. Um, I think if we go back to the fundamental part here, there's an overarching lack of a policy and lack of a strategy in terms that I've already mentioned at, at, at departmental level in terms of, I think we, uh, we're we a victim of our own success in many ways. The Irish medium sector has grown and grown exponentially year on year and I just think the system has failed to catch up in terms of uh, accommodation. It's a big one for us. As I said, 60% of our schools are in inadequate, temporary, not fit for purpose accommodation. Um, whilst much has been done over the years, um, you know, we do have lovely Irish medium schools around. We only have one currently outside of Belfast, um, Gale School and Grand and Oma, with a second one due to open in Straman, um at the end of the month or straight after Easter. But we have an example for in Derry City, for example, we have three schools, all of whom are growing. One is sustainable and has been sustainable for a very long time. The other two are growing towards sustainability and will reach that in the, in the next few years. The reason why they haven't been able to reach sustainability and <coughs> access capital um, funding is because the, the current facilities, they're, they're housed in, in um, t accommodation that is not it doesn't allow them to grow to reach sustainability a lot of our schools so they're in a catch-22 situation um there's nobody i do not believe there's anybody over over there's no oversight role in terms of where are we go on with irish medium so we'll it's it's the the age-old story of we'll deal with it as it come along as it comes along we're seeing that as a as a problem you were all acutely aware of the sem piece so i think it's a lack of stra a strategy a lack of planning um there is we have been talking to the department about the development of, um, as I said, um, I'm trying to think of the English term for it, an improvement programme for Irish medium schools because the accommodation is absolutely dire. I'm sure that many of you may have seen the latest piece on the news just last night, Bum School Column Kenya and Derry, um, Catholic, the, the one and only full standalone Catholic maintained Irish medium school is sitting in mobiles that have been there for 40 years. Not to give my age away, but that's my entire lifetime. You know, that is inappropriate. And somebody somewhere could have and should have stepped in and said, this school is growing, numbers are here, parents want this. How do we think where we are now? What are the needs right now? But where are we going? Where are we going? What is the vision for Irish medium education? What is the strategy? Um, we have communities sitting in the wings wanting post-primary provision. Um, unfortunately, we're tied to an area, pla area planning process that is not conducive or sympathetic to a growing, a young growing sector. We are in a situation where on the whole, the school estate, the numbers are dwindling and, and the, the whole rationale behind area planning was to rationalize the school estate. Where's the growing sector in there? So I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that we need something different. One size fits all doesn't work for us. Um, 
and I think that to not do so is contrary to the statutory duty. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right, post-primary is a huge issue for us. But we've also so many schools who are sitting in accommodation that I'm not sure that if you were driving past you'd want your children to go there. But of course Irish medium education is not just about the bricks and mortar. If it were, I'm not sure we would st we'd be sitting in front of you today because it's so special. It's beyond that and parents trust what's happening inside is, is special and they, and they entrust their children to us. But we need to be giving them the best that we can give them. They deserve that. Um, we don't have any money within the sector to um, engage. We have to limit and temper the um, could you focus on the expectations. expectations. Thank you, Orla, of um, of new com new communities coming forward. We have almost ten communities sitting in the wings wanting to establish new preschool provision. We can't meet that demand. There's no money to do so, and we, as a small team, we don't we aren't we are not resourced to do that. So we have to choose. Certain communities will we'll go with you this year, will come with you back to, to you next year. And we have a small window of opportunity. In many cases, when, when, when families don't see a drive forward, a move forward, a progression, they pull out. We've missed, we've missed the boat. They've gone to an English medium school. And in many cases, we've lost that entire family. So we've lost all those siblings as well. So those are other, those are whole families of children that have missed out on the opportunity to avail. So I think we, the department have said they want to work with us on this. They acknowledge that there is work ongoing. I have to be fair and say there is work ongoing, but it's a little, it, we need it now and we need it yesterday and we needed it 10, 20 years ago. So I'm hoping we have an executive now and we'll be in a better position, but the capital budget is not there. I don't know. I, I, I have to be hopeful, but obviously I have to temper my own expectations as well on that. Thank you for that. Like there's, there's much more I could ask, but we have the right officials coming in after who yeah. we can we can yeah. raise some of these issues with. So I, I'll not take any any more time on, on, on this and make sure other members can get in. Deputy Chair, you want to come? Yeah. Nick. Thank you, Nick. And thank you very much for coming in today. And you're all very welcome. When the Permanent Secretary was with us a couple of weeks ago, he noted that he was engaging with Sina G regarding to solutions to teacher uh, supply issues. The question I have is, what are those solutions? Thank you very much, Pat. And as I say, we have the solutions. Orla will, uh, has been dealing with this, so I will let uh, or to mention, uh, answer this question. F thank you, Pat. Firstly, while we have been primarily been looking at the lack of teacher, it is important to recognise that this is a problem that is affecting all levels from preschool to post primary and all roles in the school setting uh, between teacher staff and uh, support staff. However, in terms of teacher shortages, we have to look at solutions for primary and post-primary education. So at primary level, it is a retention issue. On paper, we are training enough teachers every year, um, but this needs to be monitored as the sector continues to grow. The difficulty here is that these teachers are not entering employment in the sector. Uh, according to anecdotal evidence, only 40% are taking up jobs in the Irish medium education sector on average. They're going abroad um, to the English medium sector. They're going down south where conditions and salaries are better. So in terms of solutions, we have to look to uh, retention uh, initiatives. It's not enough to uh, pay university uh, fees. We have learned that from our uh, colleagues elsewhere. Um, we need to look at proposals um, such as the DCAP program, whereby fees are paid on the understanding um, that the person will then remain in employment in the sector for a number of years thereafter. We cannot continue to train Irish medium teachers uh, who then do not end up in the Gael Scullina. Uh, this in itself is a waste of investment. Um, at post-primary level, it is uh, clearer. Um, we clearly need uh, to establish a B.Ed. or a PGCE course 
um, for Irish medium teachers, especially uh, subject specialist teachers. This is a matter of urgency at Irish medium post primary schools uh, as they are growing at the highest rate and the numbers of teachers uh, coming through each year are not keeping pace with that demand. And have you discussed this with the department? Yes, we have. And uh, we have produced a paper which was given to the department in August. And uh, so I think it's now time to act on that paper rather than have further discussion. Thank you very much. I was just come, going to come in there and say that we very often ask the department, where are we? Uh, um, with regards to this but our job is done at that point uh, really it's up to the uh, DE um, and the Department of Our Economy to uh, really come in at that point after we have done our work we can't do any more uh, really it's up to ministers to take it to the, the next part of the way and one other question uh, the Fair Shared Supported Action Plan suggests that a policy engagement strategy is required to ensure that the IM voices are uh, represented in decision making processes. Uh, is that not already taken place? And if not, why not? Again, Pat, this is a very important question, and I thank you for posing this question. Uh, I guess, again, we're back to this uh, absence of DE policy in relation to Irish medium education. And in the absence of it, the sector is not embedded in the wider education sector. Therefore, not everyone in the decision, decision making and policy making areas um, don't, uh, as their default position, come to speak to us. So things uh, and policies come out that simply uh, do not suit the IAM sector. Uh, we don't automatically get an invitation to be uh, at the table for with every uh, group or uh, and very often uh, head teachers come to us because they have got a re an email telling uh, them that there was a new program, a new strategy coming out that simply isn't uh, suited to the um, Irish medium sector. And they ask us, where were you? Were you not at those meetings? And we sometimes say, yes, we were there. And other times we haven't a clue uh, what is coming down the line. So very often we are left out whenever there are strategic uh, uh, conversations being had. And, but other times we have been in the room all the way through Uh, at the end of the day, we have only a very small team. We do our very best. Uh, we do our utmost to be uh, present everywhere. But when you put that amount of time investment in, and when uh, head teachers are taking time, uh, time that they don't have, uh, and they, they see a, a strategy coming back um, that isn't uh, suitable for the um, sector, it, it causes a lot of uh, frustration. Therefore, we are uh, dependent on uh, the goodwill of officials. Um, Uh, in the, as I say, in the absence of a DEE policy, which clearly sets out these are the sta stages that should be, um, we should be taken. These are the steps that we should be uh, taken. Now we do have a very good uh, relationship with the uh, the permanent secretary, the la deputy secretary. Um, but when these uh, people leave or move on to a different job, uh, with them they take the understanding of our sector. Um, so if there was a, 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 a dedicated DE policy, um, this would provide a structure and ensure that the Irish medium sector is put at the heart of policies that are being made. It still happens that we uh, 
uh, find ourselves having to explain to senior officials that the Irish medium sector actually exists. That's 50 years after the first Gale School was opened its doors. Um, therefore, we need a new mindset. Um, and really, it's up to us all to bring about that new mindset uh, because we're dealing with children here and we are all trying to deliver the same curriculum and we want to give all children the same opportunities. And I was delighted to hear the uh, Education Minister saying recently that he would be an Education Minister for all, including the Irish medium sector. I think that is a very good example that he has set. I know that Yassid uh, was looking at this uh, area and maybe he would like to come in here. I need to talk about the action plan is that we did in fact uh, consult the community, we worked together uh, with the stakeholders to, did so, to do some different types of proposals in, con in terms of action plan and one of the things that we proposed was this uh, idea of policy engagement strategy and as a first step I believe we have, we are taking this first step right now because we wanted you, those of you who are sitting down today, to get an awareness of, of what is happening um, at the schools, what is happening with the with the parents, with the families, and with the communities, and, uh, and, and to create this awareness first, help us, uh, all of us, to understand this need that we have been talking about, so some kind of top-down policy can be created at a policy, sorry, at a government level to secure some funding for our communities to continue working and hard with the teachers and the parents to continue carrying out the, the, the projects that, that they're already doing on the ground, but also uh, to secure funding so more research can be done in collaboration, in conjunction, with the teachers and the parents and synergy as well so we can actually put together a plan for policy at a school level uh, in, in collaboration with the teachers and the students uh, uh, at a community level, at a school level, at a classroom level, at different levels. Policy at different levels, like a policy that comes from here top down, then middle, and then lower policy at a school level to secure uh, the work that has been done for so many years to to address some of the needs that, that we have discussed today. Just one other question that is linked to that. That is the uh, gap, uh, the lack of uh, resources in the sector. And again, this is a very important question pat and i'm going to ask orla to um to um answer this and i would like the um, university to also come in here i suppose the lack of uh, resources in the sector uh, this is a long standing program in this case i will be talking about teaching resources to teach the curriculum we need to look at other jurisdictions where immersion education is available and their approaches. So in Scotland and Wales, for example, uh, organisations have been established there to provide resources for these minority languages. Um, and it really that's the sort of uh, in, uh, structure that we need because you know making Irish language resources is not something that we can make a profit out of um, uh, here for example we have Antashinid and CCEA uh, which provide great facilities but they don't have the proper budget to meet the demands that uh, is out there um, and if for that reason, we have uh, Irish medium teachers burning the midnight oil, creating their own uh, resources. They can't just go online and uh, pick up resources that uh, you can in the English medium sector, for example. Those elements. Yes, um, just in relation to resources, within our report we identified three different types of resources, so human resources, classroom material resources and then physical environmental resources. In terms of human resources, um, the Irish medium teachers are the biggest asset that there is and that is what we 
one would suggest that that's where most investment needs to occur if we are looking at a sustainable future in terms of Irish medium education. Um, that is, as, as Orla has said, there are very many ways of, of that, how that occurs um, in different places around the world. One of the other matters in relation to human resources, as they are, is that we are talking about Irish language teachers, Irish language assistants. We're talking about uh, more than just the teacher or more than just the uh, principal. We're also talking about the development of subject specialists as well. So being able to make sure that children can access the full curriculum through uh, the medium of Irish. Um, and also just to sort of mention as well, uh, the t learning and teaching materials, the teachers in our uh, report uh, who we interviewed were very clear that they can point to examples of excellent materials, but they also have considered that the breadth and the depth of those are not enough and the availability of them is not enough. Um, and so that was deeply problematic for them. Just to come back, I know you mentioned about capital bills, but just to come back again under yeah. physical and environmental resources, teachers want spaces that are supportive of learning environments teachers want spaces that they can do the kinds of activities in them that will address the needs of children with diverse learning backgrounds, with diverse language backgrounds, and for some of the teachers that we interviewed, that wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. They were ha having to operate, provide learning environments, in, 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 as one teacher educator described it as, uh, not ideal for a child learning. So that is the kind of environment that the teachers are, are, have been told us that they are trying to work in. So the the human resources, the classroom materials resources and the environmental and the physical resources are, are really key. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I have indulged the Deputy Chair. No, I know. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to move. I have, have, have to keep in his good books, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to um, go around. Anyone else who's indicated now, and I will ask for it to be, to be one question at this stage, just to make sure we, we, we don't run out of time. So, Carla, you are next. Thank you, Edgar Maggot. Thank you so much uh, for being here this morning. And I just have one question, so it all works well. Um, first, thank you all for, for being here and hearing that in the Irish language. Um, that was our first briefing, as you say, Chair, in here. It was just lovely uh, to hear. And uh, last week, I went to a gig called Shadura in Dungiven and had met with the principal there, Jermud. And we had talked at length about they have a new capital, um, a new building, um, and just talking about the new opportunities that that will afford them with uh, different music rooms and young people being able to make podcasts in Irish. Yeah. and seeing the energy and um, just the hunger to learn as well and you talked about immersion so this was a real uh, language rich environment um, and it really it really made me think about you know the difficulties with the capital funding and how that can limit uh, Irish speaking uh, students um, so I have to say moi hu to the to the uh, staff at that school because they've taken it from I think it was 45 pupils initially right up to something around 400 now which is great. Um, I have one question which I have raised uh, previously at committee and raised with the department which is around the marking um, of students papers uh, and I know the the fair shared support supported research highlights the disparity and um, the strange systemic approach towards um, Irish medium pupils. Um, can you give any further details on what this means for pupils? Um, as I've mentioned before I know it can often put them a disadvantage. Thank you. Absolutely. Gormaigat, he and Cara, um, it is a huge issue and obviously it has the potential to have massive impact on students. I'm going to ask Orla to come in on this very briefly and then I know QUB have a lot on that for their, from their research. So. Yeah, uh, Cara, I know that that has been raised previously at committee and I think it was raised at our last briefing in 2020, 2021 and unfortunately very little progress has been made since then. Um, just generally in terms of the lack of um, assessment and diagnostic tools, that's something that has been cited as far back as 1999 and again, you know, the need for bespoke assessment tools that can accurately assess a pupil learning through the medium of Irish. There's a quote that... Um, a, a bilingual person is not the sum of two monolinguals. They have a very specific language profile, and that's not something that is taken into consideration in our current assessment practices. And that's across the board from standardised assessments, you know, through to formal assessments, GCSEs, A levels. Um, I do appreciate that work has been ongoing with SIA in terms of computer adaptive tests and numeracy and literacy. But my understanding is that that has been stalled due to budgetary constraints, um, and it does now need to be progressed as a matter of urgency in relation to the GCSE and A-level examinations that you're referencing, um, the, the flawed practice of translating a pupil's exam script continues. 
this issue this creates issues every single year in terms of errors in translation and then the misawarding of grades so it's a very high stakes area um, and we can't afford to continue in this vein we need to look at solutions um, I know that as mentioned this is something that's come through very strongly in the research and we're, we're delving into this with um, Dr Sultan Turkin so um, Ashleen I think maybe Sultan yes has. yes um, so just uh, unfortunately Dr Sultan Turkan couldn't be here today but we know from the report that there is a great deal of uncertainty um, for Irish medium practitioners in putting um, uh, uh, reliability and validity into the assessments that they have to use. Um, it is certainly something that they feel that the underdevelopment of the uh, needs addressed. Um, and just on relation to the translation uh, matters, um, Dr. Sultan wanted us to note that uh, that. When we talk about assessments being translated for Irish medium pu pupils, there is a point that one would see from um, uh, international evidence that the entire translation process itself, from the moment of translation, forming the translations team, to the stage of test score interpretation, needs to be further investigated. Mm -hmm. um, She's given quite a detailed answer here about giving you an example of what that looks like. So, for example, um, when two versions of a test are made, they do need further investigation through particular theoretical analysis, through different practical analysis to include but not, lif dif not limited to differential item functioning. So making sure that the same thing, the same t the test item uh, is, is trying to get at exactly the same thing. And, and that is that kind of investigation uh, helps to reveal certain test items mm -hmm. which perhaps might favour one group of pupils over the other group. Um, and therefore, if this does happen, this threatens the validity of the whole test that's administered to the entire student population. So, in other words, um, if items are found to be favouring some test takers over others, and then the interpretations derived from these test scores would disadvantage a particular group of test takers. And this clearly has significant consequences for the youngsters who are taking those tests and end up with those results. There's definitely an equality issue here for sure um, and that's something we can continue to raise um, at this committee. Thank you all very much, Karen Maggot. Karen. Uh, Annie, you were next. Oh, well, Chair. Pat, Pat took up most of their time. So. <laughs> 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 all of our time. <laughs> um, look, I want to thank you for the presentation and, and the work you do promoting our language because I get to see it first hand. All my children, two of the boys are still in Bun School football first year, and my daughter is now in the St Andrews. But I remember that decision, both myself and my wife have no Gaelic a at all. And that decision to, to put our child through Irish medium education was not an easy one, but it was turned out to be the best decision we ever made because the pastoral care, the community ethos, the support comes with it. and. Like even the sports that came came with it. No, it's handballs played in my house, heard and camogie, Gaelic, everything. So everything comes with it, tin whistles and guitars and it, it's just amazing and, and I thank everyone for the work that they do to progress my children's education. And I suppose that's my question is gonna be around teachers and it's in relation to the sufficient supply of teachers and what impact that has a support in pupils with special educational needs and just the additional barriers that the schools are facing because it's, it's something for this committee that we really want to put in, um, a, a strong um, ethos on is, is around special educational needs and, and, and what challenges are being faced in uh, Irish medium schools. Oh my God, Danny, and thank you for sharing your uh, personal journey and of success. I'm sure uh, those principals, uh, Seamus, will love to hear all those <laughs> great words. Um, Yes, Orla is also our lead on SEM, but you're absolutely right. It is, it's such a buzz issue across the board at the moment, so you can imagine it's no different. And in fact, there are many, many additional challenges within our sector. Um, yeah, so as Maria says, we all we, we all understand what the pressures are, fa are facing all of our teachers in terms of meeting all of the needs that are presented in classrooms. In terms of how that more greatly impacts an Irish medium teacher, the external support is not at the same level as what it is um, for an English medium teacher. So we don't have the assessment tools, we don't have the diagnostic tools, we don't have the resources, we talked on those. We also don't have the um, health professionals, the you know, like educational psychologists, speech and language therapists, all those multi, you know, those other personnel who help to support. We don't have the personnel with the expertise through the medium of Irish or even with the language competence to come in and support. So 
everything's available in English only. Um, it's through pure chance and, and luck that we find someone who maybe has the Irish language skills or the, the um, Irish medium experience to come in and support an Irish medium pupil appropriately. Just to give you an example of what that looks like on the ground, if you take a primary one pupil, for example, who is presenting with literacy difficulties, that pupil is learning only through the medium of Irish at that stage of their educational journey. So at that point, English isn't introduced within the classroom because of the immersion approach. So they're learning phonics, they're learning reading, they're learning everything through Irish. Um, all of the external support is through the medium of English. So the approach to date is that that child will have to wait until they start learning formal English, English as a subject, to get that intervention. Um, so we're talking about early intervention. That's maybe three, four years down the line. And then the onus is placed on the, the teacher and our teachers are going above and beyond anyway, but they don't have the access to the external support to come in then and the parapetetic support to come in and support the pupil appropriately. Um, so I think that's, that's where the additional pressure comes from. Maria had mentioned the SEND transformation programme and that's one of our big concerns at the minute because we have been engaging with that programme for over three years now. And what's coming out in the other end of September, there is absolutely no provision for Irish medium currently within that within the plans. We have raised those concerns with the Education Authority and you know our initial ask is start to recruit on an Irish medium, English medium basis. We make up three percent of the educational population here. So start to recruit in that regard. You know, we need educational support personnel who have Irish medium ex expertise. One of I suppose one of the excuses that we get back is, is budgetary constraints but it's actually a cost neutral solution you know if you're if you're recruiting 20 people make two appointments that uh, that have Irish medium expertise um there's also a, you know pushback in terms of fair employment laws but I think if the pupil is learning through the medium of Irish then it's very clear that the support staff should also have Irish um, so there are very clear frustrations in that regard and then again this is all impacting on the teacher and the teacher workload because they have to pick up the slack and they don't have the external support so and I would just like to come in on that and say that um I suppose it's a question about equality and equity. And I, I saw a quote lately that I really liked. It said, equality is about giving every child a shoe and equity equity is about giving every child a shoe that fits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is what we get. Our services are available to all schools. All schools have access to this, but that's not appropriate. It's not appropriate. It's not. It doesn't work. So there's an acknowledgement in the first hand that we need it, I think, is, is a big thing. We need to have that acknowledgement, and that's currently not there. I don't know whether it's because of the budgetary constraints or a lack of understanding, but it is greatly concerning because these children are completely and utterly vulnerable to a system that is not designed or even, at, and in many instances, we feel willing to hear them and, and try to help. Thank you. Thank you. So... Two, two final indications I've got Kate next and I am going to be really strict here one question and answers will need to be re really really succinct and then okay, my, my question comes in five parts no, <laughs> <laughs> um, it could do the, uh, this has been I know Chad doesn't want to preamble but this has been so educational for me as someone who is new to the education committee and has limited knowledge of the Irish medium sector thank you so much and I've written down everything and would actually like to follow up with you um, at a later stage um Following on from the um, the sun the sun piece, what learning is there from other jurisdictions um, and immersive education that we could take? I guess that we need to look at in terms of what we replicate here, um, and maybe with an emphasis on sun um, and like take the point about allied health professionals. Um, what should we be looking to replicate, and what should we be avoiding? Um, I suppose, to be honest, there, <laughs> there isn't a gold standard out there because immersion education in itself is relatively new in the grand scheme of things. So we need more research. Um, other jurisdictions, such as Wales, for example, have acknowledgements of this within their legislation. Um, 
there's statutory guidance in Scotland, for example, that puts not a duty on, on the local authorities, but at least a, a prompt on them that they have to consider what provision is being made available. We obviously don't have the equivalent within our current legislation. So I suppose every jurisdiction is on the journey at the minute in terms of how do we promote inclusion and how do we effectively support, but we are probably the furthest behind in that journey. So it's it's changing the mindset and starting to look at, you know, how does this look for special educational needs provision in the immersion context and starting to implement the things that need to be implemented. Um, one of the pushbacks that we get often is, you know, what's available in the South. And, and what we say is, well, bad practice is bad practice, regardless of where it happens. It's not that we should be looking to emulate something that's not worth emulating. So there is also scope on an all island basis to work on the progression of assessment tools, for example, because you're you're working with the essentially similar cohorts um, and that can be more cost effective as well. So I think just in, in short, um, we're, we are behind other jurisdictions, but we need to be looking at what's available and, and I suppose working towards that goal together because um, yeah, no one, no one's really there at the minute. Mm. Um, if I may, just around we, that's a very big concern for obviously for the teachers that we interviewed, and I just want to share with you some some comments from them. So one of the teachers, when they were asked about SEN, were very very concerned about the gap that there is between um, the gap of support or the lack of support. So this, the, the leader, the teacher said, we've got some statements through for pupils in year 11 and year 12 that probably should have had those statements some 10 years before. So just to give you an indication, another teacher in a completely different school has spoken about the level playing field. There is not a level playing field for those going through English medium instruction and those going through Irish medium instruction. In relation to your point about international best practice, certainly we can look across the water in different areas, but also part of our findings was about being able to pinpoint very carefully about the additional competencies that we would we know that the teachers have, and all immersion teachers, wherever they're teaching across the world, have these competencies. Um, here within Northern Ireland, and, and I'll pass over to my colleague Mel just to mention a few of those. Yeah, that. sure. And just to say that um, you know, we didn't look specifically at special educational needs in, in our review, but that it, the, the competencies are are pretty much something you can find in immersion contexts everywhere. This is a this is a model that you find everywhere. This isn't some sort of unicorn unique just to here. Um, so our study identified numerous additional competencies that immersion teachers have to embed in their daily practices, and they'd be sites for further development for teachers. Um, and these would include linguistic expertise, and so that that's referring to the knowledge about the language, as well as knowledge of the language, like this, this sort of two different things. Uh, familiarity with this minoritized culture cultural knowledge, expertise with plurilingual pedagogies. These students are all bilingual, um, to Orla's point earlier, they're not just sort of two solitudes, they're, they're this, this functioning bilingual, so we need plurilingual pedagogies. Skill with materials development and technology. Um, teachers need to be competent in integrating diverse subject matter and cultural content into instruction. Um, there are competencies around understanding of political <coughs> complexities that are relevant to the specific immersion contexts. Um, ability to liaise with parents and carers to advocate for minoritized language students. This is community approach um, and competencies around the reflexivity and awareness of power inequities that are inside and outside the classroom. Uh, these are things that that all immersion teachers pretty much need to be able to do. And these aren't just like additional skill sets that are tacked on, these are embedded into the daily practice that they do. So it's almost like something that can't be disentangled. Um, it needs to be embedded all the way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if, if I may add, the impact yeah. of a person having those competencies and having developed it is is to carry a burden. And just I just would like to share what one teacher who said who spoke to us said that she had 22 years teaching and she is still working to 10 o'clock every night, preparing resources and things that just aren't there. An English teacher can go online and have a wealth of resources at their fingertips. Ours is very limited. I see that within my age group, a big burnout of teachers because it's easier to work when all kinds of resources are there. It's a well-being piece as well, it's oh, definitely absolutely. coming through very clearly. Thank you, Chair. Robbie, you get to finish, so make, make it a good one. 
I think she's going to take as long as he took. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, 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 Pat spoke brilliantly in Irish. I've never heard him speak as as much and as well but well done Pat it was, it was very good <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go at this one. I'll have to practice it in front of a mirror or something um, you're very welcome um, I, I was thinking back to, to I was in a, an Irish medium school maybe 20 years ago with a firefighters kit on um, and it seems to me I was thinking back to w- what happened at that stage because the, the primary five fire safety talk and the pack that was provided by the fire service was in Irish it was given in Irish, which was good. Uh, we didn't have the facility or ability to deliver it verbally. Um, actually, I, I'm, I'm slightly inaccurate in that we did have someone in my watch with two Irish speakers, actually. Um, one sadly passed on. And uh, if we had those guys on, they were able to deliver it verbally. But the, the benefit at the time, even if you couldn't, was the pack and the information was in Irish. Verbally, if we had to give it in English, it was probably okay. But I'm very mindful of the fact, and, it's, and, and my two colleagues, Danny and Kate, have spoken to us, it takes a village to raise a child. So my interest in education, primarily, forgive me, isn't so much the, the teachers and so on, it's about the impact on the kids. And we've heard from Gail Lynn that in Irish medium, the outcomes are very, very good in terms of employability and opportunities. So we think that the argument has been well, well, well made for that. But education changes and schools and teachers have many more responsibilities foisted on them and one of those was and it was a good thing which was the um, prevalence and the need for uh, uh, some more support for pupils in around mental health and well-being because when we talk to young people <clears throat> in terms of what their priorities are their number one priority almost always revolves around mental health and well-being so in regard when help, happy healthy minds was a very specific question with happy healthy minds was ruled out were there any difficulties in regard to access and services i'm going to be slightly controversial here but because my wife's a public health nurse who deals with um uh, a lot of people whose first language isn't English and she has to avail of an interpreter so, so I know this will be two stages so the controversy shouldn't be controversial what do we do now and in terms of that uh, facilitation of interpretation if it's required and I know what your gold standard will be your gold standard will be that people can come in and, and, and communicate um, so I think yes in, in terms of happy healthy minds yes there were challenges but I th- Irish language and Irish immersion is the priority within Irish medium schools however if a health and well-being need presents then it regardless of the language that that is delivered the health and well-being need is the priority so if necessary students will access and will be um, referred to those services but you're right in saying that we should be working towards we have a big workforce planning piece here you know and we were very heartened that in the independent review of education that they mentioned specifically that that should include an Irish medium strand so we should be looking at pathways that you can go down those allied health professional routes but you, you, you can also maintain Irish language or that you can learn language Irish language so that 10 years down the line we have access to those staff who then can come in and support um, pupils through the medium of Irish there's also the mindset piece that you know one easy solution is when resources are coming through just make sure that they're available in Irish um, and at least as you've mentioned there there is that access to the resources That's just a, is, has there been any regression in regards to, not specifically to pick the fire service out here but in terms of those agencies who do come into schools all schools um, is that still the case do uh, so other departments rather than education are they still respectful and mindful and, and yeah. good I think yeah as, as people become more aware that the sector exists especially those charity organizations there is more of a willingness and um an awareness that you know resources are needed through the medium of Irish so we have engaged with the likes of the NI hospice concern um organizations who have taken the own their own initiative to make sure that they can engage with Irish medium pupils through the medium of Irish so that's very very promising um, we also have access to the transition hub through the department of communities who are doing work you know um Free. free of charge to make sure that resources are made available so um, yeah we're going in the right direction I'm not sure if what you said wanted to come in just on that community piece I know we're tight but it takes a village to raise a child I don't know if you want yeah, to yeah actually <laughs> uh, okay. it, that idea resonated a lot with me when they talk about the it takes a village to educate because some of the things that I have been doing for the past few years in my life in different parts of the world like um, Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Mexico, the United States, Canada, now here is more and more I am seeing pedagogical approaches and research that centers or, mo- or, or moves away from the capitalistic mindset of 
learning a language. In other words, I have heard students and teachers say, but what's the point of teaching Irish? If, what, how are you going to use it? What's the point of this? Are you going to get a job with this? But then a lot of people think that at missing the point that learning a language or the language is not necessarily because I'm going to get a job and I'm going to get money, I'm going to get a car, I'm going to be rich. It's not that. It's about heritage. It's about history. It's about language. It's about learning from each other. And most of the work that has been done with these communities here in Irish media instruction is about that, it's about revitalizing that language, the culture, the heritage, in connection with the communities that are coming in to the city and Northern Ireland, the immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers. So I guess uh, just just to wrap up my idea is like yes we need more funding yes we need more 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 funding for both uh, doing more research uh, as to how we can move forward into a direction that is counter intuitive to this capitalist capitalistic mindset and more moving towards this idea of the hunger to learn because we want the students to be hungry to learn as opposed to oh now i need to take this test oh my god this test again we don't want those minds we want how proud i am of learning this language and now i'm like some of the the people we interview they say i was so happy to see my child singing this song in irish when i was like you know like having dinner with them i was like this is the beauty of this the beauty of this is not about you're gonna get a job and then you get to use you know irish in this particular shop in ireland or whatever it's not about that it's about the beauty of the heritage history language and culture and that's what we as researchers and in collaboration with cng is about how we can combine both um research but also with the help of you as policy makers how can we move forward as society towards these goals just fine one just to finish out i, I, def- I was going to say i don't think there's maybe a better point at which uh, we could well, conclude I, well, because <laughs> i think that that is that has maybe summed up our discussion I, I, pretty well i think it's really i'll be really brief for this okay and it, it, it's off the back just of the way you are pushing your luck it's here. off the back <laughs> it's daniel mccross used to do this all the time it's off the back of a debate yesterday because i'm really interested in something you said they're learning from each other and i think there's a, there's a journey that we all need to take in this country particularly people of a certain vintage um learning from each other do you guys engage in a shared education project? Is, is the schools involved in shared education? Because I think it's really important that children from all school backgrounds get the chance to meet and engage in, in, in the manner that they... And if we can we, do it, the answer in yeah. less than 30 seconds. We absolutely do. I'm just, I'm just, I would be very mindful. I've been working in shared education through um, Corleone Gale School Act as far back as 2011. What I will say is there are specific challenges in relation to shared education, again, including our needs. I think we cannot get to a place where shared education works across the education system until we get to a place where we can share bilingually. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure the system has included that in, in its plans. Um, and, and I think absolutely many schools are involved, but we have a journey to go on in terms of ensuring other schools are willing to share with Irish medium schools and also that Irish medium schools be included and able to express their identity as part of those sharing sessions. And that can be only done through bilingual sharing, which is uh, it's another journey we need to go on, but it's, it's absolutely vital. And those schools who are involved, there are so many success stories. So, yeah. If you get in in the next session, you'll be very, very. (laughs) (laughs) Sincere thanks to all of you for your presentation. I know we have run over time, but I think that was really worth covering in the detail we covered it. And I I would suggest that there may well be actions arising from this, but perhaps after we've spoken to the departmental officials to to just uh, agree on some actions arising uh, from that. But thank you for for your time. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity. I get anything that I give you the shadow case. And we're just we're going to bring the departmental officials through now. And again, we are really really pressed for time. So I would just appreciate everybody's help to get through the the, the session usefully, but 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 succinctly if possible. Well, that would be easy. Yeah, go ahead. Okay.
daughters have a, my pronunciation wasn't good enough. That's an Irish, so I wasn't allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I need to practice. Let everybody get get settled, and then we can do do introductions. So. Uh, I'll refer members to um, their papers, so we have a clerk's uh, brief at page 146 of tabled papers uh, and then also a written briefing provided by uh, the department on, it's an update on the Integrated Education Act and that's at page 32 of your papers and also in correspondence there is a letter from the Minister for, uh, following committee correspondence regarding the Struel campus so I'd ask members just to, to note all of those mm -hmm. at this stage. Um, so you're all very welcome here today. Thank you for uh, for giving up your time to come and speak to the committee. Um, so here with us today we have um, Dr. Suzanne Kingan, uh, Acting Deputy Secretary. We have Mr. James Hutchinson, Director of Collaboration and Climate Change. We have Eamon Broderick, uh, Acting Director of Sustainable Schools Policy and Planning. Uh, Margaret Rose McNaughton, Director of Transport and Food in Schools. And Stephen Cray, Acting Director of Investment and Infrastructure. Um, so I'll hopefully hear, hear from you all during the course of the session. Um, we, we should apologise, we, we have run considerably over time in our, our, our uh, committee um, session today, but we um, do want to, to have as much time as possible, I think, for, for question and answer. Um, so presentation, we usually say 10 minutes. If we can come in under 10 minutes, that would be uh, would be would be really welcome. Um, and I'm also conscious, as with all the de departmental briefings we've had so far, your areas of responsibility are pretty far reaching. So it, it may be difficult to cover everything that members want to get through today. So we would hope that, you know, there will be future engagements on, on some of the, you know, the more detailed aspects of, of your work within the department. But at that, this point, I will hand over um, and we'll hear from you um, to, to get us started. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today about the work of the Sustainability and Infrastructure Group within the Department of Education. And just to say, as a group, we're really looking forward to working with you over the next number of years. The group has responsibility uh, for a number of key areas of education delivery, and these include area planning, school admissions, capital investment across the school's estate, the Stroll programme, shared integrated and Irish medium education, as well as school transport, free school meals and uniform policy. I'm sure you'll be very happy to know I don't plan to try to cover all of these in my opening remarks, and I know you'll want to return to many of them over the coming weeks. I thought it would be helpful, however, given the recent coverage around Fresh Start funding, and the fact that we're entering into the budget negotiations just to give you a flavour of the unprecedented challenges we're facing in regard to capital investment across the school's estate. The department's annual capital budget is around 170 to 180 million pounds and historically from this we've taken forward a mixed programme of new builds, large-scale extension and refurbishment projects through the school enhancement programme, a minor works programme which really it is a misnomer. It's everything from large-scale works to support the development of the Irish medium sector, accommodation after development proposals, right through to emergency works, statutory works and curriculum-related works. The capital budget also has to cover a wide range of other needs, most notably the ICT infrastructure across the school's estate, um, and we have currently the rollout of the EDIS programme also covers things like the replacement of the bus fleet and local capital spend on equipment by schools. Over the last number of years, a number of critical challenges have emerged that means we're now facing a crisis across the school's estate. And the situation is no longer sustainable without significant additional capital funding. And I know this afternoon many of you will want to ask me about individual much needed projects for schools right across Northern Ireland. And regrettably, I don't have straightforward answers for you. We have a static capital budget in an environment of significantly rising construction costs. At the same time, we're facing what I think can only be described as a twin crisis. Um, first of all, needing to provide significant additional places for rising numbers of children with special educational needs. And that involves things like putting SPIM, specialist provision in mainstream classes, into schools and expanding the special schools estate. 
And we estimate that SEN will require about £400 million of capital investment over the next number of years. The second half of the crisis is the ageing and dispersed estate. With many schools that were built post-World War II, uh, mid-20th century schools that are reaching the end of their design shelf life and they're just no longer fit for purpose. We have a long backlog in planned maintenance and it's all taken its toll. Alongside all of that we have an outdated technology infrastructure which requires around £256 million of capital investment through the EDIS programme over the next number of years. And just to emphasise, we have not actually received any additional capital funding in our baseline to meet the crisis associated with special educational needs. Alongside that, we have now also lost £150 million of Fresh Start funding that was long promised investment to the education sector. And as a result of the issues we face, our capital budget strategy this year, and unless we get additional funding next year, is essentially reduced to meeting our contractual commitments. We have eight new builds on site and one school enhancement programme and a wide range of ICT pro contracts. Also, our budget is used to ensure that safe schools remain open and safe for our children and to provide the adaptations and places for the most vulnerable. At the minute, we cannot afford to do anything else. And some of the decisions that we've had to take to control spend include pausing all new major works and school enhancement contracts, uh, a wide range of ICT related decisions, for example, not rolling out end user devices to schools across Northern Ireland, land purchases for all our major work schemes, all our curriculum related minor works have had to be ceased. We had to remove delegated authority from schools for capital spend. Um, all new youth projects, again, all, all paused. The bus replacement paused, first, out, first start devices for disadvantaged children. So it's just to give you a flavour of the hugely difficult decisions that we've had to make. The Education Minister has submitted bids for over £540 million. Uh, capital is built from a zero baseline and we've submitted that to the Department of Finance for next year. And within that I would really draw your attention to the fact that we need £271 million for inescapable requirements. That's our contractual requirements and our statutory and legal obligations including around £70 million pounds for SEN capital next year. I suppose we just want to give you one message about the group on the behalf of the group today. It's that as an education sy system we cannot continue with the current levels of capital funding. We are really at risk of not meeting even the most basic requirements of keeping schools open and providing places for our most vulnerable. I suppose just to be clear our aim is that every child would be educated in a high quality learning environment. That doesn't mean a new build, but it does mean a high quality environment. And capital in education terms is there to support the curriculum. It's not about just shiny new builds, it's there to support the curriculum. All the evidence tells us outcomes for children, their motivation, delivery of the curriculum are better in high quality learning environments. So I know there's many important issues across the group that we haven't touched on and I know some of your questions will answer, I'll touch on those but I just really wanted to focus on the hugely significant challenges that we're facing around our capital budget which in many ways I think echo the, the difficulties that we're facing in a resource position that I know all our colleagues have talked to you in previous sessions about. So thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, the, the brevity in, in the uh, in, in the presentation. And again, I am conscious that, uh, that there's a, there's a big big area to cover here. So I'll I'll try and deliver my questions without any preamble. Um, and it is it is two two questions. And we did just have a session uh, with Cena G there. I'll maybe leave that for other members to pick up on because I think there are undoubtedly going to be questions around Irish medium uh, education just on the back of that. But to to stick with capital. Um, we've identified as a as a really key priority for the committee already is, is the delivery around SEND provision and you have highlighted in your your uh, opening remarks just the level of challenge in terms of capital investment that is is, is uh, that we're dealing with at the moment could i just ask and, I, and i've been repeating this question sort of on, on every time SEND comes up 
first sort of big pinch point we're approaching is September and it is delivery of places. Can you give us a sense of the level of capital investment that is required to deliver those specialist provisions in mainstream, to deliver the required number of places that are going to be needed and crucially in appropriate facilities that the children are able to access from day one of their, their, their placement. So what, what, if you can give us a sense of, of, of where we are at with that, with that deadline approaching us yeah, very so, rapidly. So in terms of our figure work, we're working closely with our colleagues in the EA to really get a line by line uh, indication of every capital scheme that's needed for September. We do have broad figures. We've submitted that bid, as I mentioned, to the Department of Finance um, for £70 million for next year. And that's a mixture of, I think the figure is close to 100 new specialist provisions in mainstream that are required. There's also extension and expansion of the special schools estate. And in the background, we're working on a range of larger projects as well, such as the new special school in the Greater Belfast area. I think it's important to understand that not every specialist provision in mainstream needs additional accommodation. Some schools have capacity, can house it in that capacity. Some schools can do it with a small level of reconfiguration of their existing accommodation. Some will require um, additional accommodation. The critical thing is our budget at the minute that we would have through the draft budget is not enough to provide those same places. So unless we get an additional 70 million pounds over the top of our our usual baseline, we won't be able to deliver those. So that's, that's the critical thing. It's all about the funding and we need more funding to meet these places. Our baseline last year at the start of the year was 9% less than the previous year. We have got some additional funding very late in the financial year with the return of the executive. The problem with that is we've had to spend the previous 11 months pausing things, stopping them. You can't suddenly wind them up again in five or six weeks. So it's an incredibly difficult position. We've tried to continue the planning of everything we need to do so that we haven't run into a situation where we've wound things down. But we know that unless there's significant investment, we will struggle to make the pla to meet the need for those places. So, we, the minister has brought that to the attention of the finance minister. We've brought it to the attention consistently and repeatedly to officials in the Department of Finance, and we continue to work closely with them and with colleagues in the Education Authority to make sure that we s secure the additional capital for our most vulnerable learners. Stephen, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add there. Or? Covered most of it. Chair, I think it's been fairly well covered. Just to sort of reinforce that, and the year just completed, uh, the department will have invested 47.35 million across that continuum of provision in special education. That's that's children presenting with special education needs in mainstream schools in a normal classroom, um, in SPIM special uh, you know special provision within schools in the learning support, as well as the the special schools themselves. We continue to work with our colleagues in the EDA to try and take a more strategic view on that and we have bid we're bidding actually to try and proactively create a standalone program and budget stream for this rather than continually uh, just drawing on the other program streams which means we can do less conventional minor capital works and less major works less school enhancement works because a considerable pro proportion of the budget is being used in the year for special educational needs that was maybe it means other high priority work in the non-special areas is just not being taken forward it has, has no choice but to be paused the, the difficult decisions that Suzanne has referenced and I, I will not. I don't want to take up too much more time, but I think this is a really key key area, and, and, and especially with with the with the, the time ticking for September. And I know that you're not responsible for for the placement aspect of this in terms of you know identifying the places for for children or allocating where children should uh, should be educated. But I mean, one of the, the the stories and the feedback that I hear from principals in, in this in this scenario. And it is it is delivered with deep regret. They they would describe it as almost when it comes to placing children with special educational needs as a as a horse trading that goes on of just like will you take this child you know you know we need they need a place, uh, and they feel that they are very often bounced into with just you need to set up a specialist unit set up a spim, 
and then that the, the provision in terms of the classroom space is often not adequate. They're, they're promised a mobile, but they have the children in their cohort and the mobile doesn't arrive till December, January. So can you give assurances that if if there is a rapid response being required here, that the, that the capital aspect of it will be delivered in a timely fashion? But I would add to all of that, I, I don't think our children with special educational needs should be caught on a system where they are being fitted in, squeezed in, we'll, we'll stick a mobile unit on the fringe of the school somewhere to, to accommodate these children. I don't think that's anybody's idea of an ideal, but if we are in crisis management scenario again, how, how nimble can the system be effectively? Uh, so just pick up on a couple of points she raised, Nick. I suppose just in terms of the placements, uh, I would emphasise that myself and Stephen and other colleagues in investment and infrastructure, we do sit on the placements group and we do work closely with both our policy colleagues colleagues and DE and EA colleagues so we do have a joined up approach there and we recognise the capital and policy have to work together closely. Um, it's not a case of capital sitting in isolation and we have worked very hard over the last number of months to make sure that we are much more joined up in terms of that approach. In terms of delivery, yes of course we are looking for uh, ways to move things forward quickly. Um, the difficulty for us is right back to the funding. We cannot, I cannot give you assurances when the funding's not in place, um, much as I would like to. The other issue that I would raise is, we would hope that wherever possible, the specialist provision in mainstream can be located at the heart of the school. We absolutely don't have an approach or a policy of locating our most vulnerable children uh, in mobiles or on the outside. That, that goes against the whole ethos of inclusion and all of our new builds are designed with the SPIM provision right in the heart of the school. Um, and We do look wherever possible to locate the SPIM provision right in the centre of the school because we don't want a situation where those children feel that they're on the outside of what's going on. That's not inclusion and that's not our approach. But certainly we will be doing everything we can over the next number of months to make sure that capital <coughs> investment adequately and appropriately appropriately supports uh, the same placements program but as Stephen alluded to if we're really going to get in front of same placements and we're not going to find ourselves in a crisis situation we need planned and sustained investment we need to know the levels of investment that we're going to have available and we need to plan it in a managed way as a SEND capital program. We need to get ahead, we need to plan new provision, we need to plan those extensions to our special schools estate alongside the SPIM provision. Um, and we can only do that if we're clear that there will be sustained increased levels of investment right across the schools estate. That's the way that we're going to conquer this in terms of the capital provision. Thank you. There's, there's, there's many, many more questions I could ask and there's many more aspects to your work that I would like to pick up on, but I just think time is going to beat us. So, Deputy Chair. Uh, I have just one question, seeing as I hogged the last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, as you know, Suzanne uh, Coyle and Gail Scully were in giving us a brief in there. And they were uh, particularly critical of the accommodation for the Irish medium sector. I'm, I'm just going to use a couple of examples from my own constituency as a sort of microcosm. Of, of the broader sector. So, for example, you have College to First Year, which is supposed to have a capacity of around 600. I was talking to one of the governors a couple of weeks ago, and <coughs> uh, and he's of the view that by September there'll be over a thousand pupils in that school. Uh, and I know temporary uh, or, or modular, I suppose, is the proper term that's being used now. Buildings have been put in, but still, in all, you know. Uh, there needs to be a, a site in, in North Belfast uh, procured, and I know there I know there are difficulties around that, but but the issue is College First Year is bursting at the seams. The other school I want to raise with you, and I know you've been there, Suzanne, is Gale School in London. Absolutely. You know, and uh, it's not fit for purpose, and, and 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 you know that yourself from having been on it, and I acknowledge that there has been some remedial work carried out over the last uh, number of months, but. Uh, you know, you talk. You talked about strategic plan for uh, for for sand schools and placements and so on. But would you accept that there's something similar needed for the Irish medium sector? 
Thanks very much, Pat, and Stephen will come in with some of the detail, but I suppose just to emphasise, and I'll come back to the two schools specifically, but just to emphasise that we have made significant investment in the Irish medium sector over the past number of years, um, £25 million. Pounds. Um, at the minute, we have, for example, a project on site at Galescoy Calastadera um, that's costing over three million to refurbish uh, the leisure centre in terms of providing sports and canteen facilities for that school. We made a decision to continue that investment despite the hugely difficult capital position that I've outlined to you to you earlier in the piece. So I suppose it's just to emphasise we are absolutely committed to investment in the sector and we're absolutely committed to working with Synergy and uh, with Antivis Nagel Skoliak to, to have a strategic approach to Irish medium provision. Just to pick up on the, the schools you mentioned, in terms of Calaste Fiesta, uh, we've put on uh, for last September um, an eight uh, modular block of accommodation onto the site but we've been working recently to look at the use of the Corpus Christi site next door in terms of a significant refurbishment potentially as a junior school site for the school and we're working closely with both the school leadership the board of governors um, and both and all the sectoral representatives around that in terms of providing sustainable Irish medium provision in West Belfast we do accept of course the need for provision in North Belfast and Stephen and the team have been working hard there to try to locate a site. It, it has been tricky and um, it has been difficult but I think we actually have the potential for a fantastic plan around Calastafirsta and that's something we'll pursue, continue to pursue with the school over the next number of months. Again, Gilskoil and Lonan and the lower falls there I absolutely acknowledge the poor quality of the accommodation. Um, we have put significant investment in. We've actually extended the Irish Medium Accommodation Fund, which sits with Intivis Nagil Scoliacta, to carry out some curriculum related works there to make sure that the accommodation is safe for the children and that it provides a welcoming environment for them. But again, we're committed to working with that school to look and see what the long term solution can be in terms of providing um, better accommodation there because, you know, we can see they don't have the outdoor play, for example space that they would need on that site so we need to look at that but we also have to be mindful of the fact that that's a school that's very much based in a local community and if we take that school outside that community that can cause difficulties too so we need to work closely with the school and I absolutely acknowledge the need for investment in those Irish medium schools and in other Irish medium schools but we are back to the point that I made at the beginning it's all one pot of money it's a static budget it hasn't it hasn't risen. Construction costs are 30% higher. We just aren't able to get what we used to get for our budget. And that has a knock-on effect. And it will have a knock-on effect in the Irish medium sector as well. And uh, we want to get significant additional investment to invest in that sector. I mean, another school that I would mention would be School and Rocket on the Armour Road, school that's in temporary accommodation that we have a fantastic major works program set up for that's ready to go into procurement and that regrettably because of the financial position we haven't been able to move forward. So I think you find there's no lack of commitment to from colleagues in the department, um, particularly in the investment and infrastructure director, to working closely with the schools and the sector to invest in them, to make sure that the accommodation's fit for purpose. But like many of the other areas of this state, we are hampered by the budget that is available. Okay, and, and I thank you for that, and no doubt we'll come back on it at a later date. But I just want to make one point. Uh, I mean, there's this view that all the sectors have to be treated equally, and so they do. But what has to be taken account of is that the integrated sector and the Irish medium sector have historically been underfunded, and that statutory duty to encourage and facilitate the Irish medium and encourage, facilitate and support the integrated sector place a, a, you know, a responsibility on the department to ensure that those sectors are brought up to a level with everyone else. So, but I'm not, I'm not asking a question, Suzanne. I, I don't want to get in trouble with no, the chair. So, well, again, I, 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 there was, there was, oh, I, I might at risk asking a question just on that. I mean, one of the things that came through from Synergy really clearly was on almost every question that was asked was, we need a policy for Irish medium education. We need the department to set out a policy of how we will encourage and facilitate. 
and that will cover everything from capital investment to workforce. Is, is the department going to deliver that? Yeah, I think the, the answer to there is that is certainly the intention the department has is to develop a, a rounded policy for the Irish medium sector which will cover, as we talked about, the accommodation strategy and a wider strategy as well in relation to the, the Irish medium teaching. So that is something that is certainly on our list. Yeah. Is that something delivered in this mandate? Uh, we would certainly hope. I, have, I mean, it's no secret we have a very small resource. I've asked for more resource to do just that. So it's something that is very active in terms of what we want to try and achieve. So yes, hopefully we'll get some progress on that. I will revisit. Cheryl, you were. Thank you, nice. Chair, um, and thank you there for the update. It's a bit of a daunting capital situation, I think, Ren, at the moment. Um, I've just got four questions here, so we'll try and get them out as fast I, I, as possible. I, 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 we're not right, going to get through four. Three, three. <laughs> I think I'm going to. I'm going to draw a line at two. <laughs> right, yeah. fine, fine. We'll put them all together. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the the capacity and planning needs for saying, but particularly autism training. Um, it's just how many teachers have you has been trained. Um, um, you know to deal with that capacity but also um the likes of mandatory autism training is that something that department is going to push forward um i was a, with a school there recently and they're having a real issue with their maintenance and their cleaning budget where they have basically been given a, a, a bill um, which was 50 percent higher last year for the same service which and they don't they're already in a deficit um which is a major issue and then just an update on the school enhancement fund and the maintenance service program of unavoidable works if that's still going ahead or if it's if it is paused is there an intention for that to be opened again so uh, thank you very much for the questions and i suppose just to start with the autism training um I'll have to get policy colleagues to write back to you on that. The, our group wouldn't be responsible for the delivery of SEND services, but uh, I know policy colleagues can come back and provide you with that information. Um, just in terms of the charges around the maintenance service and uh, for grounds maintenance in particular, um, the Education Authority, due to the overall pressures, on the resource budget have had to look to introduce charging for ground maintenance services and to increase the charges for grounds maintenance services with the schools. Um, that's an inevitable consequence of the shortages that we face. Uh, our recurrent maintenance budget has been under pressure for many years. It currently sits at 20 million. We have bid for 35 million of resource maintenance this year uh, as a bare minimum to the Department of Finance. We also have managed to continue with five million of ring fence maintenance for the special skills sector, but it's all down to the funds that are available and the fact that we can't continue to, to deliver that service free at the point of delivery or with historic rates that don't cover the full char the full cost you know so it has had to move to a full cost recovery basis and i acknowledge that that will have a knock on effect and impact on school budgets um in terms of the school enhancement program uh Stephen, i'll hand over to you on that one um I would emphasise planning is continuing around those projects. It's getting them onto sites the problem. Yeah, as you may be aware, 72 were announced to advance mm -hmm. under the Skill Enhancement Programme second call. Only one of those is actually on site currently as a result of uh, budget pressures that Suzanne has taken the committee through at, at length there, so we'll not go into that. Um, there are a number that will reach pretender stage as we call it which is fully designed planning in place and ready to go um, and they will be paused at that point subject to the availability of capital funding i should point out just relating to the previous question 10 of those 72 are in the special schools so they are absolutely critical to those special schools to get those works advanced and um, again we will be taking those through to the state of readiness uh, with the view that if budget comes available we will we will shift them on but obviously um like many of our projects, we're faced with a number of delays. Um, while skin enhancement programmes are of smaller value than a big major works, they still go through all the same designs, the same planning applications, statutory processes, everything applies. So um, at this time, one of the 72 is on site. The rest are at various stages. I could get you the detail, but you know, if you wish. But Yeah, no, that would be perfect. Yeah. It's a brilliant programme. It's a really great way to invest in schools and to 
you know, make up for curriculum deficiencies, particularly around sports provision, specialist science provision, make sure the schools have the sufficient number of classrooms. It is a fantastic programme and it is really unfortunate that due to the budget position we're having to pause these schemes and we can't move them through and there's many, many projects that are in much need of investment right across the schools of state. Uh, well, unfortunately, that's the position we find ourselves in in terms of trying to live within our uh, capital budget. It, it has been a success. Set one has delivered those refurbishment works, the additional accommodation works that minor works just couldn't reach far mm. enough to deliver, but never made it into the major works category because maybe it was just a school needed an additional block, yeah. an additional sports facility or whatever, that SEP was designed to, to address that very need. So SEP one, all those projects, big success story there, we would just need the budget to get shifted on with SEP2 and that much needed investment. Yeah and we are continuing the planning I think I mentioned that already you know I think that's really important and we're doing that across the piece we're doing that for the Irish medium sector we're doing that for SEN because we don't want to get in a situation where additional funding is secured and we can't deliver the project so we've made the strategic decision to continue f planning these projects to try to get them into a state of readiness uh, so so that they're ready to go whenever the funding is there. Thank you. I can feel um, Nick's eyes on the back of my head. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But even if you can, just send me um, some details about that. So. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. And I think when the session's finished, we can pick up on other strands of the work that we, we want to focus on in future sessions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Danny, you're next. <coughs> Thank you. And, and I will be quick because I don't need to go over the points we've made in the last number of weeks around special educational needs. I'm just going to pick up from, from the chair. Just in your assessment, how many special schools do you think that we need? So at the minute, obviously, we have a special schools estate of 39 schools. Mm -hmm. The Minister has recently approved the development proposal. Pardon, uh, the Permanent Secretary actually approved it before the Minister uh, had returned for a new uh, special school in the Greater Belfast area. We are working with colleagues in the Education Authority to identify where new special school provision may also be required across Northern Ireland. What I would say to you is it's not just about new schools, it's about extension of the schools we have. So through the school enhancement programme, but also we hope to wrap it all together in terms of an SEN capital programme. We know that there's many of our schools that were that had a certain physical capacity um, that that they can house, we know they need to be bigger and they need know they need to be able to take more children. So we're very conscious of that and they say there's 10 schemes within the school enhancement programme. We know that there's other schemes that need to be brought in in terms of extension. So it's very much a three-pronged approach in terms of SEN. It's provision of those specialist provisions in mainstream. Um, it's extensions of our existing special schools and it's new special school provision wherever that's needed we'll see. So, but by that answer you're saying one no I, i'm saying at the minute we've one approved development proposal but in your assessment how, how many new special schools do you think we need? so we're working with the education authority to ask them to bring forward plans in terms of where absolutely new provision is needed where extension isn't required so i'd probably rather not put a figure on it today i'd rather get that work completed and make sure that we're absolutely clear around where that provision is needed um before I say, you know, I don't want to put a figure around it just no, this afternoon. Because it's I know, and it follows up on that because you said that the part around Irish medium and that the derelict buildings you mentioned, Corpus Christi, Justin, and I, I suppose that's a part of the conversations that looking at other, I suppose, assets that the department has and derelict buildings that that, that could be used. Just one more a wee quick point on all of that, there would be fall into transport in this because no matter what we do, we have to bring it back down to, to, to the ground and making sure we're improving people's lives and accessibility. Because what I found was when a lot of children got placements in the last two years, that through no fault of their own, there was transport issues and they didn't get to school for long periods of, of time, mm -hmm. leading to school absentees and, and you're seeing that in the headlines um, this week and that's a part of it as well and I, I was, I went to the opening of, of Main Cap back or God, feels like ages ago but it was before the assembly was up and running, fantastic facility and the work that was being done with the EA and all, and all of that there but when we had a wee sit down with the parents afterwards and everyone started talking it was very quickly uh, that those parents were coming from all over and they couldn't get there. The, the people had never met each other before were sharing lifts and that wasn't always there. And 
that's a huge problem as well. So that's that. All of that there needs to be factored in, and I'm really, really concerned about, about September. And there's shells of reports there that, like, we can't say that we didn't see it coming. It was we've known it for a long time. So we absolutely need to match all our services. All our services need to fall in behind in terms of, of transport for the children and SEN. Of course, that's correct. In terms of the use of the existing estate. Uh, colleagues in the Educational Authority are already doing that. That is what's happening on the ground. And i just give you a couple of practical examples. There's been a number of satellite provisions that have been set up in former school premises. We are, for example, working closely with the Education Authority to look at the Suffolk site near the St Gerard's Educational Resource Centre and look at what provision could be provided on that site in terms of additional SEM provision. So absolutely, we've got a flex the assets that we have, we've got to flex the existing schools estate and make sure that we're using all the means possible uh, to accommodate children. But I, I would go back to the point of there isn't sufficient capital budget to meet the needs of children with SEN. We need huge investment in this sector over and above the ordinary levels of investment that we, we would have had in our schools estate. And we can't do that with the levels of capital that we have. We absolutely need significant levels of funding. We can plan well. We are planning well, in my opinion, in terms of the wider wider schools estate. Um, we have a range of programmes there. But unless the funding comes in behind them, we won't be able to deliver in a timely manner for children. I appreciate the, the funding constraints and we've been underfunded by the British government for, for far too long and that's been well acknowledged. See, just so far, you just mentioned St George. Could you send me a wee update on, on where the Suffolk site's sitting? I would be more yeah, than please. happy to do that. And just one last wee point, because it runs the SPIMS. How, how many Draw SPIMS on are in grammar line. schools? Yep. Out of curiosity. Um, could I come back to you with that figure? No, Is that okay? Thanks, Donna. Robert? Are you sure? Um, I'll try and just get straight to it then. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the problem for the department is compounded, I think, sometimes by politics, it would be slightly controversial. The, one of the former education ministers at the end of 2022 made an announcement of uh, it committed to £800 million worth of buildings for school, 28 schools. What process does the department then employ to keep those schools informed of the viability or, or the likelihood of those being built. I imagine that eight hundred million pounds in twenty twenty four probably looks like a billion and a half or something. So you know something kind of out there. I mean, are those twenty eight projects are they likely to happen? Uh, and and is there an ongoing process of communication with those those schools? So, yeah, Robin, and I'll, uh, Stephen, I'll come in on on some of the detail. But I suppose just to say at a general level, that figure of eight hundred million pounds was uh, an approximate or an indicative cost uh, around those twenty eight projects that were announced they all have to work their way through a feasibility stage and then a business case to get accurate costs indeed we need to work out what the preferred option for investment is in those schools so it's very much an estimate at the outset that that would be the value of that program as I'm sure you're aware the permanent secretary had made the difficult decision to pause the procurement of the integrated consultancy teams for those 28 schemes which were right at the beginning of the planning process the Minister has unpaused the seven highest priority schemes to move those forward and take forward the appointment of integrated consultancy teams for those. And I think that is important because it's the point I was making earlier. We need to keep that pipeline there in terms of our planned investment. If we stop all our planning, we won't have the schemes ready to go to site if and when the investment is available. So I think it is important we keep that pipeline. In terms of communication, we'd obviously written to all of the schools whenever that announcement was made. But Stephen and myself have been out round many of those schools, uh, talking to them about their schemes, explaining the position. And Stephen and the team are in regular contact. Stephen, is there anything to really add there? I mean, realistically, they're all post-primaries. So even if they were released, Today, you know, you're quite a few years before we would even be moving to construction or handing the keys over of a completed building. Um, we've met with each of the schools, we've explained the position. Seven, as Susanna's referenced, have been unpaused and we're, we've moved immediately to procure the professional teams for those. Now, that's going to take a bit of time going through the procurement. We've also engaged with 
the remaining 21 schools uh, that are in other tranches because engaging with the industry when the minister announced 28 the last thing we could do was deluge the industry with 28 procurements for consultant teams they, we agreed with them we'd do it in four tranches and um, there is disappointment out there from those in tranches two three and four that they weren't in tranche one but the tranches were based on the scored list from the protocol that was used to select the schools in the first place and we felt that that was the fairest way to prioritize we do and continue to engage as recently as Friday I was out with the school just last week um, and I, given those timelines and this school was in is currently in tranche four um, I agreed to work proactively with them to look at a, a master plan a program of work to look at their immediate needs the medium term needs and obviously the long term the longer term goal to hand over the keys to a new building so we will continue to work with all those schools yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's it's not a departmental, it's a ministerial decision to do something like that to announce such a that was a hugely ambitious um, commitment to make. But you're, but you're dealing with people's wishes and aspirations. Setting that aside, um, I, I and given what, what most of the people have been talking about, Harbert and North seems, from my perspective, seems to have been a success so far, um, and there's possibly the realization of us having to do something different then go out with these massive grandiose schemes of, of building new schools everywhere that there is a, a, a rationalisation of this, the estate that we have. Yes. So could, could you give me an update in terms of if, if the department have done an assessment of the viability and success of that? Because I think a much more pragmatic route might be to look at the, those wins. Yeah, I think generally, um, I'll just pick up on Harvard and North, just to say all our, our, all our programmes and projects are subject to a post-project evaluation so we're always trying to pick up the benefits uh, and the lessons learned from any of our projects. I think more generally we do accept that there needs to be a slightly different approach to capital investment given the budget that we have available. Uh, it's really important that as many children and young people as, pos as possible feel the benefits of capital investment and we definitely want to w move away from a system of winners and losers where one school in an area might get a new build and that's the lotto ticket and other children remain in poor and substandard accommodation so we are really conscious of that we have some excellent plans around what i would call high impact low cost projects and what i'm talking about there is things like outdoor play facilities for primary schools, uh, curriculum related projects, for example, around pitches and sports halls, things that make a real impact on the ground, on the lived educational experience of children and young people. We, we want to do that and we want to really expand the reach of capital and make sure that as many of our schools as possible feel the benefits of it. The problem for us is we can't get beyond the minute at the minute with the budget our contractual commitments and providing SEN places that, and keeping schools open. We have a lot of great plans in the background and the Minister had announced our work on the investment strategy and we will be articulating those and I think you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that every child and young person sees the benefits and that we work towards a high quality learning environment and by that I said at the beginning I don't mean a new bill but I mean you know, disabled access in their school, no temporary accommodation, that the school's safe, that um, the, heat, the heating and environment's right, that there's good outdoor play space, that there's the right specialist facilities for the curriculum. We need to work towards that for every school, but we are hampered, and I'm sorry to go back to the budget, but that's the position. But I think the point you're making, you know, is an absolutely right and appropriate one around balancing it. Equally, we have schools where the only solution for them is to rub out and start again because they do need the new build because when you put money into some of those schools you're putting good money after bad because the facilities are so poor so we have to get the balance right uh, in terms of that. that that balance has to include that not every major works will end up in a new build it could be an extend refurbish which could deliver the same outcome in the end of the day we are as well as the targeted programs we are focusing on what we're doing across our programs as well i mean i have one school as a good example in particular whether there is a school enhancement program works there there is a number of dp outcome works there uh, there's also a big issue with spalling and that means basically the facade of the building is falling off so it's serious health and safety issue when we add those together that's north of 15 million pounds worth of work that will not change one jot 
the suitability of that school. It'll not make the corridors less, yep. you know, uh, uh, the classrooms any bigger than they are. The uh, you know the the class or the corridors any more less circuitous or anything like that. We're proactively looking to that to say, is there something better we can do for that school for the similar amount of money and deliver better value for the public first, but also for the the children, the teachers, and the school community in that area. So we're doing that across the piece uh, continually. We need to just, pro- I think I have to draw a line at that, that stage, uh, Robert, just just in the interest of, of getting everybody the opportunity to, to ask so yeah. Cara if you want to come in. Very quick, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, just to go back there to uh, the special schools topic. Um, so next week I'm meeting with Ross Maher, special school in the Mavadi, um, who, vo- who have voiced their concern about they have a beautiful, relatively new building, um, incredible staff, uh, but next year um, the intake of pupils... The, the building just does not facilitate uh, what the demand is. I'm just wondering, um, has there been any conversations um, with not only Ross Marr, but also a mindful Arden She was a £28 million project, and there's significant issues there with the large number of pupils and ensuring that that building is fit for purpose. Um, can you just outline if there's any conversations you've had with either of these schools regarding these, these issues? Yeah. Um, we recognise that... There is an issue there in terms of some of these historic builds and around the capacity. And we are working very hard with our colleagues in the EEA to look at these areas and see what is the appropriate long-term solution. So you mentioned Ardna Shee there, and we need to think carefully, what's the right answer for Ardna Shee? Is it trying to increase the capacity of an extremely large special school already or is it perhaps a two special school model there or you know twin satellite provision so absolutely all of these schools are on our radar we know that we need to plan strategically for the special school sector and the work that Stephen talked about earlier and myself around the SEND capital programme one of the key tasks there is to make sure that we future proof and that we're planning effectively um, as, as our children come through the system what I would say is the spike in numbers of children with special educational needs coming out of COVID is rapid and it's absolutely unprecedented. So I think we have to set everything in that context whenever we're talking about special school planning. We will get the right solutions in place for these schools. Uh, All of our schools are built with the facility to extend, and that includes all of our special schools. But we also have to make sure that we build schools that are the right size and that are manageable in terms of, you know, there's an optimum point for special schools and building them too large for large numbers of pupils that would be akin to an ordinary primary school isn't necessarily the right solution either. So we need to we need to get inventive, we need to make sure that we're delivering the right solution for the area, the right solution for the children, and we really are aware of that, and that is the thrust of our SEND Capital Investment Programme. As, as Stephen said earlier, for too long we recognised that SEND had been just an element of all of our other programmes. We need to give it a focus, a prominence and make sure that we really have a data focused and appropriate approach to planning for both our special skills estate but also uh, SPIM provision um, right across the piece. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, that, that clarity is definitely very helpful because I'm just mindful September is coming very quick um, and those questions urgently need to be answered. Um, just one final very quick question, uh, just around uh, the topic of the Climate Change uh, Directorate. Um, there's been um, a really interesting pilot programme to do with um, electric uh, storage and to do with batteries and I'm just mindful in the cost of living crisis and when we talk about sustainability in our schools, ultimately we want to use anything we can, whether it's solar panels or battery storage to help alleviate uh, schools who are overwhelmed with uh, rising costs. Uh, is that something you're looking at when you're renovating and building schools, uh, utilising uh, those, for example? Um, the, the climate change issue is an important one for us. I think the main focus the department has at the moment is using the curriculum as a means to promote learning about the climate change issue. I think it comes back to the first point as Anne raised. The lack of capital in general means that putting on additional capital elements to new builds isn't open to us. We'd love to be able to have the finance to say, look, we can add those resources to new builds, but it's something that we'll certainly make, be, be, be bidding for as we go forward. And we are at the moment, even in school design, using the um, the guidance that we follow from um, the building regulations about um, environmental requirements so that it is part of our program but we certainly would like to do more. Yeah.
couple of aspects to that, Cara. There's obviously the existing estate and trying to, if you, you know, trying to deal with the, you know, carbon issues there in buildings with single glazing, limit, limited insulation, and um, flat roofs quite often. And so it, there is a difficulty there that we're going to have to focus on. But in terms of a new build, I can assure you that uh, all new builds are brought forward with, uh, in terms of the current building regulations, which take account of all the, you know, the guidance legislation, etc. And it does change. It changes it, you know, the whole time through uh, the design process. We even have schemes on site where we have ha we're having to take on, you know, provide additional layers of insulation, etc. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it'll, schools will just not get signed off in the end. So I can give you that assurance that new builds do pick up on on the on the the various building bulletins in that regard, as they're called by the councils. Um, the existing estate, how we're how we're going to retrofit is going to be a different matter. And again, back to Suzanne's point, regularly it's. Uh, it's going to be very expensive and where that budget is going to come from among all the other priorities is going to have to be given serious consideration. And I suppose Cara just to flag uh, on foot of what Stephen said there, we have submitted proposals around the retrofitting of the state as part of our contribution to ISNI, which is obviously you know the investment strategy for Northern Ireland 2050. Yeah. We are very conscious around the need, um, but at the minute our priority has to be keeping schools open, keeping children safe and uh, providing places for the most vulnerable. And I think it's an excellent example of one of the things that we know we need to do. Mm -hmm. We know we need to do it quickly and we know we need to get on the front foot with it. But our budget just doesn't allow us to do it. And we're having to choose between the immediate and pressing need around providing education for children on a day to day basis um, and the need to invest in retrofit in the school's estate uh, over the longer term. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, your time today. That that is us out of time for uh, for, for for this uh, item in the agenda. But no doubt you you'll be back before us uh, uh, before long. As there was a lot of issues we we we, we 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 didn't get get the opportunity to pursue in detail. But, thank you so much you. for having us, and we look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you. All right, very quickly, um, I think there's probably a number of uh, items that we might want to follow up on on that in terms of actions from the committee. I would like to propose a couple and I'm very happy to hear from other members. I think on the back of the presentation from Sina G, um, I, I would suggest that we write a letter to uh, the Minister from the committee asking uh, how he'll respond to the recommendations in the QUB report. I think that would probably cover everything that was discussed in terms of how we, we address that. Is, are, are the committee content with that as an action? Department. Yeah, to write to the department, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, in terms of uh, any other uh, items uh, that, that the, there might be an interest in follow-up on, happy to hear from members at this stage if there's any other proposals. I, I certainly would say there's a lot in, in the departmental briefing that we might want to pick up on forward work planning for, for future briefings. But. I, yeah, just one, Chair. I think, I think we're already on it, but we just need to refresh ourselves again. The Department Secretary, as, as Suzanne rightly pointed and she took my question from me, was he announced, uh, I think in October of 23, a new school opening in September. I think it was for September 24. It is, I, I've been asked, I, I think, I've, in fact, I've been told that they're actually recruiting for a principal, but we don't, I don't know what the school is or wh whether it'll be a Harbert North type refresh somewhere but it would be useful for us to, to be asking very pointed questions about so that in September we're as useful as possible just to keep the focus on there for these places and I, I know it's sort of repeating what we've said but I think just and I'm, I'm certainly happy with a piece of correspondence yeah. along those lines to the department also yeah yeah Committee we agreed yeah agreed yeah okay that's fine. So, uh, look, very, very long sessions today, but I think all, again, uh, very useful, but it is, it's, it's a real challenge to get through the business and the time. So um, I'm going to propose, as we go on to item nine, uh, correspondence. So the clerk has provided a note um, at uh, in your packs, uh, item 8.1, um, and that's page 66, sorry, page 9.1, page 66 uh, in, in your packs. There were some additional tabled papers, but... Or as the committee agreed that, that we deal with the correspondence as set out in that note but I would ask that a clear note there's a lot of requests to actually brief the, the committee and I wouldn't want any of that to drop off so that that is clearly noted for forward work planning that, that we that we do make sure that those groups who've written in that we, we are giving them the opportunity to present. Yeah. Yeah. Very very briefly just need to declare an interest in regards to the uniformed organisations at 9.3 I'm an officer in Boys Brigade this last 20 years but it's interesting to note they uh, facilitate 45,000 young people on a weekly 
weekly basis. So they're not in, uh, you know, they, they do good work. And I think we talked about the uh, uh, non annual last, is that right? Uh, I was going to raise that on forward work planning in terms of, okay. I, I, well, I think it's we'll, we'll come to that um, to, yeah. see, to see where we get a, where, where, where we can get a good fit for the youth work stuff, but no, that, that's noted. Um, so yes, there, there are a number there. The British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, really, really key in, in the Healthy Happy Mind space. So just to make sure that is all definitely picked up for, um, for forward work. Uh, planning. I'll just go quickly through a couple of that are there in the table papers that uh, that, that weren't in the note. Item 9.11, uh, an invitation to attend the Northern Ireland Nurture Group Network Annual Conference. Um, uh, can I leave that with members to, to respond to if, if interested uh, to attend that? I think time is quite tight on that. And then another invitation also from the Ulster University School of Education to an event celebrating the success of a, a project uh, promoting uh, confidence and competence in numeracy with adults again that's on the 19th of march and i'll leave that for members to to respond to directly but but i would ask if the committees agree that we maybe do just note that in terms of uh, forward work planning i think for a, for an informal session that would be a, a really useful one to uh, to potentially engage with if that could be noted clark and then item uh, 9.13 letter from the Northern Ireland Youth Assembly requesting um, that members of the Youth Assembly Committee come to watch one of the meetings and then speak with us after. Um, and I'm happy to facilitate this in any way that the committee uh, agrees, but I'd be delighted to welcome the members to the committee, but, but also to hear from them in open session. But potentially they are going to now be attending, is that right? At the yeah, so on the 20th there will be five youth groups, including the Youth Assembly, and they will all get to give a brief introductory um, brief. Position. So I think we're, we are covered that they're, they're attending next week, but I think if they would like to come and observe another com committee, we, we should extend that invitation to them to make sure they know that they're, they're very welcome to, you know, to, to have, even have that informal engagement. Aside from those ones highlighted from table papers, are we uh, content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary noted page 66? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So that brings us to forward work program. Um, so I'll speak to it just very briefly generally and then just to pick up on um, the, the point that, that Robbie had raised around the youth work um, side of things. I think we, we have a, a fairly clear agenda for next week and for the week after recess. If members are agreed, I'd be content that we agree that forward work plan as sits now. Mm -hmm. But with the maybe just added caveat of everybody could confirm an, uh, availability just through the clerk for a strategic um, planning session because I do think we need just a couple of hours, not asking everyone to give up a day, just to make sure that we, we, we have that covered and that everybody's had an opportunity with appropriate time to raise what their strategic priorities are for the weeks ahead. Uh, have we a date in mind? We don't have a date yet because I haven't got any indication of when members are free. Um, so is it more helpful to circulate it, a two or three dates and uh, for people to, yeah. to confirm yeah. availability? Should I offer Fridays? Is that best? <laughs> I, was, I was just going to ask about something else. So I'll go okay. Away. Okay. <laughs> could, could, could it, Thursday would suit me best. Uh, I, I don't know why it would suit everyone. Thursday, Thursdays work for me. And I can be flexible Thursdays and Fridays. And I, I, during recess? I was going to just say, I mean, I'm open to it during recess as long as that doesn't clash with leave plans, obviously, for, for the clerk. I have yeah. in recess, but if it could be done recess, it would help this. Yes. Yeah. I was just going to ask if it possible, I'm just mindful our informal meetings normally take place at 9am on a Tuesday. I'm often driving for us. Um, is it possible for me to maybe submit a question at the start of the meeting in the chat box and then that be facilitated? Um, because I'm driving. I have no issue with that yeah, whatsoever. Okay. Um, and I think there's probably scope if we have an informal strategic planning session to have a discussion about how we feel the meetings are structured, how uh, what the informal sessions, when they're best, when, when, when best timings for those and all of that. So happy to include all of that. Okay. Um, the only other thing that is just specifically around the youth work um, aspect, because we have uh, the week after recess, we have the EA in, and we have the Youth Work Alliance sitting in there as a, as, a, as another briefing. We've had contact from the uniformed organisations. I just wonder whether, given that we're getting a first day briefing from the EA that will cover a wide range, whether there, there might be scope. You had said there might be a de departmental interest in presenting on that day. Is that right? Uh, even the department yeah. has a SEN update ready that day yeah. and have planned to come. And, so and could it, that could, would be could possibly then. I was going to suggest: yeah. uh, uh, is it worth, given the, the the broad range of groups involved in youth work, that we we have a session specifically on youth work related issues, get a briefing specifically on that from the EA, and get a 
briefing from a couple of the, the key stakeholders and factor that in even around informal sessions. Are, are we agreed on on that? Yeah. Yeah. Can we just yeah. in the day then not doing them on the same day? Yeah. I, 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 I wanted to raise the point just the fact that t- today I would like to spend more time with every single one of them and I think it was unfair and we don't do ourselves justice. It, it was just too squeezed today. I, I th- and I think this is definitely something for strategic planning we yeah. need to focus on because there's uh, the meetings are too, they're, they're just too squeezed. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I don't know how long the briefing from Reyes took do, do you have an idea? It was supposed to take an hour. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suppose we had a bit of a delay at the beginning with technical issues. But. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think, you know, when you have, uh, I think we had four sessions today, didn't we? We had a shorter session. Uh, yeah, yeah, legislation yeah, yeah, as well, yeah. 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 You know, the, no. It was it was a lot to squeeze into. Oh, to, to, it was a lot to. After the race, everybody was pretty <laughs> dead. <laughs> so again, if we can get our availability to the clerk, get a date in, in the diary, we'll hopefully iron some of those issues out. Um, can I check just to go back on the youth work one that we were we're happy with a specific session, uh, an open session on youth work. Um, oh yeah. yeah. So committee agreed on that. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, and I'm sincerely hoping the answer to this question is no. Is there any other business at item eleven? Well. <laughs> <laughs> so we can we can we can move on. I, I raised earlier with the issue about Lockshire, but yes. I'm happy to leave it until another day. Yeah, I think uh, I think that the the, the multidisciplinary teams disciplinary teams is something we are going to yeah. pick up. So um, yeah. that, that's great. Appreciate that. Uh, item 12, date, time and place of next meeting. So the next committee meeting is scheduled uh, to begin on Wednesday, the 20th of March, 2024, 2pm, room 29. Um, but could I ask that as we have the minister in that day, would members be content to come a little earlier um, so that we can just coordinate our questioning to make sure that we, we, we are getting the most out of that session? What date is that again? So Monday. even, yeah, 22, uh, 20 to 2. That's good. Yeah. It's on the 20th. It's next, next Wednesday. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, procedures on a Wednesday, but it's not, it's not sitting next week. It's the week after. Okay, so that, that, that suits them. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, but the question is that the committee meeting does now adjourn. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. We're having too much fun. Keep going. Committee room 29. Sound. Committee Room 29, sound. (coughs) Committee Room 29, sound. (coughs) Committee Room 29, sound. Committee Room 29, sound.